This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Ken O'Keefe. Ken, how are you? I'm a blessed man. I'm having a good time here in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know? mm-hmm. Former US veteran, um, involved in a lot of madness, opened your eyes to a lot of madness. You're now classed as a terrorist now. Um, you're very open about wars. I think you've saved turtles. You've done a lot of good work as well. You've kind of, yeah, this is what it's all about, is to understand humans, understand your life, and understand the stuff that you're seeing now. Um Fair play for standing at the forefront. I know it's hard because when you try and speak out against the things that were programmed to speak out against, you get, yeah, you get flattened, basically. <laughs> You've tasted it firsthand, but first and foremost, how are you? Yeah. No, you don't get rewarded for doing the right thing in this world. The more debauched you are, the more you'll get rewarded. Take that Lolita Express flight, too, and you'll get a nice little job. You know, you'll be a prime minister, you'll be in parliament. No, yeah. They don't reward good behavior, not right yet. We need to change that. Definitely. How long did it take to then look at everything differently? You know, my great blessing, and I love irony. Irony has always been really, really fun to me. Um, you know, I joined the Marines at the tender age of 19. I really had no plans of joining the military. I was living a life. I've had many chapters in my life, and this was another chapter. I was living in a place called Encinitas in San Diego. For those who've been to San Diego, Encinitas is like the best part of San Diego. I was a surfer. I could overlook the surf. My life was grand. And me and my mate decided we, we were going to watch Blockbuster, you know, when you used to go there and get VHS tapes. And I had been meaning to watch Full Metal Jacket for some time. And it had come out recently. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I watched that movie. And my favorite director of all time, a Jew, Stanley Kubrick. And that movie is like a documentary. And I remember having no plans of joining the military. I was a waiter in a French restaurant making good money, living on the beach, driving a beautiful car, having some lovely ladies in my life and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I remember watching that movie. For those who haven't seen it, I recommend it if you really want to watch something good. And uh, in the first five minutes I was watching it, I was like, yeah, that's what I need. And it, it was a combination of my daddy didn't love me properly so i will impress you dad (laughs) you gotta love me if i'm a marine man infantry no less so i signed up for the marine corps believing my nation is the greatest and blah 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 plus i thought you know this ought to become a man you know what's more manly in an american use mentality uh than than being a marine not army not navy not no marine infantry dress blues and all so i joined up and I was damn good at what I did. Boot camp was a breeze. I went to the School of Infantry for six months, which was hard training. And, uh, and you know, I was top Marine. I was put in the highest position of authority. Uh, I had the M249 SAW squad automatic weapon, which made me assistant team leader in a fire team. And 
literally, I, I actually, I loved it. I love a challenge and it was hard training, man. There's things we do in the Marines that are like, it ain't built for lesser men, dude. <laughs> There's a saying in the Marines, quit your bitching, get it done. You know, like your toe hurts. I feel sick. I got to feel, shut up. So, and all of that came to a head when my leaders, not leading by example, gave an unlawful order and, uh, and I'm like, no, I didn't, I did not sign up to just follow orders. And aside from that, the Uniform Code of Military Justice says your duty is to not follow orders. So for in the modern day context, let's give an example. When Joseph Biden, traitor, kid toucher that he is, sends Americans off to, to Gaza where they just killed people, literally American troops on the ground slaughtering, that's an unlawful order. That's an unlawful order by a traitor. Your duty is to disobey an unlawful order. Contrary. And remember World War II, didn't they say, oh, just following orders, right? No, I didn't just follow the order. I went from being the best Marine to the most hated Marine by my command. And I'll never forget the words of my uh, platoon sergeant. He said, he said to me, you're the biggest piece of shit I've ever known. And I'm going to fry your ass first chance I get. And that's a 17 year Marine who's a hard man. When you're platoon sergeant in the Marine Corps infantry declares his hatred for you and then you go to a war with this man in charge of you um, I'll tell you what man it was either wither away and ugh, become a shadow of myself or stand up be a man so by the time I got out of the Marine Corps I realized this was the red pill I was wrong about the Marine Corps what else am I wrong about and I studied voraciously and everything I read, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, the autobiography of Malcolm X, A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn, uh, Manufacturing Consent, Noam Chomsky. I read all these books and I was like, whoa, man, everything is a lie. And I mean, literally, I've been studying this stuff now for 30 years. But then I came to a point in my mid-20s where I read another book called The End of Nature. And I read in that book by Bill McKibben about how genetic engineering was more dangerous than nuclear weapons, how one genetic experiment gone wrong could create a chain reaction that could literally exterminate life as we know it. And I was like, am I the only person who knows this? And like, we need to solve this. This is unacceptable. And I, I basically kind of give all that to my mom. She just was such a loving mom and she cared so much for everybody. And I care about this world. I love this world. I, I have a good life, you know, even when I'm down in the gutter, homeless, in a prison, being tortured. Man, I'm, pff, give me seconds, man. I didn't come here for an easy ride. And if there's a problem that needs to be solved or a challenge that needs to be met, well, sign me up, man. Yeah, I love that. So we look at our skies being sprayed, our food being sprayed, our manipulation through TV, our manipulation through wars from people who fund both sides of wars. You think the streets would be packed with people protesting mm. with the destruction that's happened? It's the same patterns, 1984, George Orwell will go through all the patterns, everything's the same through wars, through manipulation, through vaccines, through plagues. It's all there, it's all man-made. And I, I'm interviewing a woman called Barbara O'Neill soon. It's all about the herbs and how everything can be cured. And mm -hmm. But again, deplatformed, nobody wants to hear this noise. And this is my sort of podcast because I'm still sort of learning. And it can be damaging towards the soul or whatever it is being a searcher but you just want the world to be a better place and a good place and it can be a good place but when you're caught up in the rat race people don't want to believe it and sometimes i look at other people ken and i think are they the lucky ones because they're just doing their 95 going along and naive to it and having their meals and a little bottle of wine and watching their tv at the weekend just oblivious to what's really going on in the outskirts. Mm -hmm. sometimes i look at these people and i'm envious because sometimes i try and switch off but something else will pop up and I'll research that and I'll think, fuck me, all those numbers and names on certain McDonald's or all these foods and how it's all connected, Walt Disney to Hollywood. You go down the rabbit hole so much and you go, wow, how fucking deranged and satanic is the world? It's crazy, but we'll get into everything. But I always like to go back to the start first and foremost about you, Ken, where you grew up and how it all began, to get more of an understanding of you, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I was born in the summer of love, 1969, just across the Golden Gate Bridge in Napa, California, in Silicon Valley. My dad was a brilliant man, uh, a damaged man, abused badly as a kid, put into an orphanage, mentally, physically, and sexually abused. God bless you, dad. 
So he wasn't really capable of giving me love, but he was a genius, and they sent him to the highest tech school in the Navy, so that's why I was born in Silicon Valley. Uh, on the day of the fake moon landing, yes, I said that. We've never been to the moon, and it ain't none of it's what it seems. But nonetheless, um, they were also doing a ceremony, a place uh, called um, Bohemian Grove, uh, the cremation of care ceremony. Nixon and uh, Reagan were there that year, a satanic ceremony. We can get into that later. But I don't believe in coincidences. And I grew up uh, mostly in San Diego. We moved down to San Diego, which is a big Navy base. And my mom and dad divorced at five because at the end of the day, she loved him, but uh, she loved me more than, than daddy. So um, my mom raised me and my fondest memories, I love the 70s, my favorite uh, decade of music as well, Doobie Brothers, Fleetwood Mac, all sorts of great stuff. And, uh, you know, for me, going to the beach and playing football, I hate the way the Yanks call it soccer. It pisses me off. It's football. <laughs> really ridiculous. Anyway, um, I was very good at football. I loved it. Played at the highest level as a kid. I, I went to the beach, boogie boarding, surfing. Um, you know, I did what a typical teenager would do growing up in middle class suburbia, you know, chasing girls at puberty. I still remember their names. Um, learning how not to do it. <laughs> I could easily give advice on how not to win the favor of a, of a lady. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, in high school, boy, I was drinking it up, partying, driving drunk, you know, oh my God, you know, you, there's, you can't get anywhere in, in San Diego without a car. And I figured I'd rather be the one driving drunk than having some other person do it. Thank God I never hurt anybody, but it was a crazy life. And, uh, and then I joined the Marine Corps, which I already explained. By the time I came out of that, you know, that's, that's when I really started uh, many, one of many chapters. Like, I have so many different chapters in my life. This yeah. is another chapter now. I think that's what it's all about. We all have a story. Everybody's chapters are different from pain to happiness, success, darkness. It's just all different chapters and waves. Yeah. And how you get through those waves, you either grab, grab a surfboard and surf those waves and ride life the way it should be fucking ridden, or do you sink, crash and sink? And I think a lot of people crash and sink, and it's not their own fault, but it's the programming from very young age, from the injections through cutting the umbilical cord, through women giving buff on their back, and everything's kind of backwards, everything's labels and religions and divide and... Nothing is what it's yeah, saying. Yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it can be, I wouldn't say draining. I kind of enjoy lo looking at the other aspects of life and questioning what we've been taught at schooling and even the schooling system, again, it's a dark place. But see, when you, a lot of, I interview a lot of veterans and SES, SBS, a lot of tough, tough men who you just know they've got it. They've got that mental kind of scar where they're psychotic. It's psychotic behaviour to be, because the biggest, you know yourself, the biggest fall, the hardest, it is, it's, but it's a mental, it's something to be here. Some of the guys at SCS, I'm trying to understand humans, but when I look at these men, they've got something in their eye where just get fucking on with it. They'll never be broken, but a lot of them come from the broken homes, mm. the lack of love from their dad. Why do you mm. think that is? Yeah, well, you know, for me, it was, I've always, I, I give it back to my mom again, because I'm a firm believer, like, I thought about this uh, several years ago, like, how do I have this supreme confidence? Like if I wanted to try and teach somebody how to develop confidence, which is very different from cockiness. Cocky is a weakness. Yeah. You've got insecurity. If you're being cocky, you're weak. If you know what you're all about, you know who you are. You don't need to impress nobody. You know, you don't have nothing to prove. But my mom gave me the love and security that allowed me to push the boundaries out. And I didn't like bullies. I've never liked bullies. I still don't like bullies. And the biggest bully is my birth nation and their little podunk, Israel, you know, Israeli state, telling them what to do. We're little bitches for that state. So anyway, we'll get into that. But you know, I pushed the boundaries. And for me, uh, you know, I'll, I'll hold off on that subject too. But you know, when it comes down to war, I didn't sign up to be a pogue and back in the rear with the gear. I signed up to be the guy in the trenches. I, I was a machine gunner. I'm not the guy who wants to be on the sidelines. I'm not the second, you know, uh, you know, the second teamer. I'm the guy who's out on the field. I'm the guy who's who's in the trenches. If there's a challenge to be met, then I I I I, I try and formulate the best way that I can meet that challenge, and do it. You know, what is my objective in life? A better world. That's no bullshit. I, I've never expected to reach that point. But funny enough, with this horrendous reality in this world that we see right now, nothing but smoke and mirrors. 
where you have people of honor and integrity in the gutter being punished, myself included, under investigation for hate speech and terrorism. That's me in this Orwellian upside down bullshit world of ours. And look at these criminals prancing around. Rishi Sunak, who's this billionaire <laughs> bitch who's like, you ain't voted in nowhere. Never mind all these other people. Like th now we've even got, what's his name? Um, Keir Starmer, sir. That bastard excused Rick, uh, Jimmy Savile. He's the one who signed off and said there wasn't enough evidence. That bastard is going to be the prime minister. So a guy who literally, literally, who signed off and said not enough evidence of the man what we now know, Sir Jimmy Savile, who raped 500, 500, while being greeted by the Queen and, uh, you know, BBC covering Keir Starmer, is this acceptable? I'll tell you what, I'd rather die in the fight than bow to that crap. And, you know, this country did me a favor by arresting me and go on, investigate me, you bastards. Throw me in pr I don't care. I will die with my honor. To me, that's what's lost. You know, I, we said this as we greeted before this interview. There used to be a time where you could shake hands and that was a deal. Your, your word was your bond. Where is that gone? Where is that gone? Where is the old school men? What is this progressive, feminized, pussy-ass BS? I have no problem with gay people, but I don't want to have to explain to my son why these two men are French kissing over here. I don't even want a straight couple doing that. Why are you groping each other like that? Where's the family values gone? And I mean, I'm a massive practitioner of freedom. Massive. But freedom without ethics is why I call this place Sodom and Gomorrah. Anything you want is on tap in this town. Fun as hell if you want to come and have a debauched, you know, like morally depraved good time. I've done it myself, not to the greatest degree possible. But the world is upside down, in my opinion. If we're going to boil it down, we need to turn that world right side up. That pyramid <laughs> that's like that with all the power at the top, we need to invert that bastard, turn it back like that. And I swear to God, we are at that point right now. I don't know if you feel the same way, James, but... You know, people say, oh, not in my lifetime. Oh, it's always been this way. Oh, I'm only one person. What can I do? Shut up with those damn excuses. Everybody makes a difference. Everybody. If you throw a cigarette butt on the ground, you just made a difference. If you pick up a piece of trash and put it in the bin, you just made a difference. If you open a door for an old lady, you made a difference. You know, we all make a difference. Now, if you want to make a bigger difference, then put more effort into it, for Christ's sake. If you want to set a high goal, like mine is about as high as it gets, you don't expect to be uh, to be able to achieve it. Work for it. Work for it. Be ready to die for it. You know, as Patrick Henry said, one of the great American patriots, give me liberty or give me death. I, I don't know, man. I mean, there used to be a time where men were men like Spartans, you know, like don't mess with them. <laughs> the Celts, man, my people, man, I'm more Celt than I am Yank. And, uh, you know, we know genocide. It's in our DNA. You're a Celt too, so I mean, as a Scottish, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we know it, William yeah. Wallace, you know. And I think <laughs> we've got to be the masculine energy is provide and protect. We are gatherer hunters. We should be out there providing and getting our food. And but I like you say, it's becoming a weekend generation, and we've got a Pride Month. It's a full month of Pride. A month. What the fuck <laughs> they celebrating if you're gay? Listen, like you say, whether you're straight, by I will sit with anybody and have a conversation with any man, any woman, or who you want to identify with, whatever it is. I'm just not going to play your game. Yeah. Um, and that's okay. I'm not putting you down, but that's just the way I've been raised. It's the way I see the world. I don't throw it in your face. I'm a straight man. I'm this, I'm that. I just want my kids protected. And I feel as if, as a father, and I feel as if we're catching up to a lot. A lot of people are homeschooling now, growing their own fruit and veg. But whoever operates this world, they are 100 years ahead. So whatever we catch up to, they're creating new things to then try and unwire and try and debunk again. They are keeping ahead. And if it's, I could just, a frustrating thing. just on that note, because I know that touches the nerve with a lot of people. Look, my belief based on empirical evidence and looking at genuine statistics is that I, I really don't know if God made gay people like, but I have lots of reason to believe that's true, including a gay friend that I had in my 20s when I worked at Greenpeace after the Marine Corps, when I became vegan because I didn't want to hurt anything, literally. And I remember asking him, like, I really, I love the guy. I really loved him. And I almost wish that I could be bisexual, but I ain't never been confused about this, you know? <laughs> 
Uh, I have not been confused, but I love the guy. He was vegan. His values were really beautiful. And so I asked him, like, you know, gay, like, wh where's that come from? Like, was there anybody gay in your family? And I remember he told me this. He said, he said, you know, when we were kids, we used to play superheroes in, in, in my neighborhood, right? So, so all the boys we played and, and, you know, there was Superman and Aquaman and, and, you know, and Spider-Man and I was Wonder Woman. And I thought, wow, like I never as a boy would I have been, I'm Wonder Woman. Like, you know, and it, it kind of made me think like maybe for sure, like there's a decent chance God made gay people like that literally it's, I don't know, but I see the evidence. But now if you look at the homosexual rates, because it's been so rewarded, we have a gay pride month. A month, a month. Back in the day when I was a kid, if you called someone a faggot, those were fighting words. Now, you'll be welcome with the red carpet and, you know, get more jobs. And if somebody, God forbid, discriminates against you, you're going to have all sorts of rights coming your way. So we rewarded it to such a degree that we have now kids that aren't only just becoming gay or deciding they're gay, but we have this transgender thing. In my home state of California, a kid can chemically castrate without parental consent with the full support of the state. If that ain't satanic, I don't know what is. And, and so getting back to the point of gay people, I have no problem with a person doing whatever you choose to do in your bedroom between consenting adults. That is up to you. However, this propensity and this glamorizing if you watch the telly here oh my god between the transvestites and the gay couples and all it's almost more homosexual than it is heterosexual and if we look at this logically where are we going in terms of procreation if we go that route down i have extinct tattooed on my belly from 30 years ago why would i put extinct down there because we're going to be extinct if we continue acting like this. And, it, and for those who become so secularized, that's what they've done. They've secularized this, right? They've made religion so perverted, like I'm Catholic born, right? When I saw cardinals and bishops raping choir boys, that was it for me, like fuck off to the Catholic church. You know what, you're holy? But there's a confusion between religion and spirituality. People can reject God all they want. God bless you, God help you. There is an eternal spirit in here. That to me is more precious than this mortal life. I don't care what price I pay in this skin. I will die with my honor, with my spirit intact. And I have a question for you on this note, because I know you ponder things too. Do you believe that people on this planet have literally sold their soul to the devil, to Satan? Do you believe that? Do you believe that that's possible? Yeah. So do I. And I see tons of of empirical evidence and i know that they do satanic ritual sacrifices of children i know they stick daggers into babies i know this is part of how you join the club uh dutch banker i forget it bernard who talked about it there's others as well but people don't want to face these dark realities they'd rather getting back to the people you're talking about walking around willful ignorance God gave us a mind, gave us a brain. This thing works. I am not like Nikola Tesla. Yeah. You know? But you see, once they get through those levels, the change in their signs, the cover in the eye, the 666, the dressing of the devil, that is their, that is their God. That is who they believe in. And it is satanic. It is dark. Um, you see, the like, um, prime example, um, what's the kid's name? Sam Smith. Yeah, um, yeah. And people, you, you're not calling these people out, but you see the total change in them and how much media coverage they get is because they're playing their game. They're in that club. They're in the club. And it's sad and dark. And people, you just need to look at the clues of their music, what's said in the music. They look at the CIA who took over the rap industry and hip hop so they could promote violence and hate towards black on black and just how it damages with the frequencies from 808s and it just changes the fucking frequency we in your like brain. Tupac Shakur changes. We got to make some changes. You know, when yeah. rap had some real he message, they took it over and they turned it into bitch, ho, and bling. Yeah. Morally debauched society, you know, and, and th this is a social engineering agenda. It's actually not as complicated as people think. Like I've studied mind control. I've studied history. I've studied psychology. MK I've studied Ultra. anthropology. MK Ultra. It's all trauma-based. And, and 
you know, the, we, we, we can see this on a multitude of levels. There's only really, if we're going to boil it down in the simplest terms, there's only two ways, two options in the way you approach life, literally. And they propagate one to such a degree that it explains this bullshit world we got going on. Fear, love. Now, between the two, which one will trump the other? Love. Love. Love is when uh, your mother is getting uh, approached by a gang of 50 Russian gangsters armed with Uzis who are about to strip her down naked and, uh, and rape her. I love my mom too much to run away and save my life, even though my mom would probably plead, run, save yourself. No way. I, I'm going to die right now, and I swear to God I'm going to take one of you bastards out with me. Love is what makes a grandma be able to lift up a car and pull someone out. <laughs> love trumps fear, but fear is what they propagate everywhere. Mind control. Watch the news. Stabbing here, rape here, murder there, corruption there. It's all bad news. There's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of solutions out there. There's history, if you really want to get into a bang-up interview, which... You know, I'm supposed to be a little bit strategic because of the way I'm approaching things, but I just, we don't have time for pussyfooting around. If we look at history, we can find an example of where we actually had a better world in a microcosm. We had it. When? And we well. lost it. And the ones who tell us our history are the ones who told us our history and our perspective about the Palestinians. Who told us the version that we've heard about the Palestinians. Who told us the Jewish state of Israel had no, quote, partner in peace? Who told us from Hollywood to have uh, the values we have? Who owns Hollywood? Who owns this country? How much debt do we have in this country? Seven trillion pounds much. How much debt do we have in my country? 34 trillion dollars is there enough money to pay back this debt and who do we owe that to and what did they tell us about history as a whole when did they ever tell us the truth about history when at what point what point of history can we point out that is official where it's actually true we can go back to virtually everything weapons of mass destruction remember that one how about 9-11 uh, and Muslims did this operation, yeah? 19 hijackers with a dude on dialysis in a cave in Afghanistan without a mobile phone overpowered the entire might of the U.S. system. The biggest military in the world, spending more than all other militaries combined, beat by 19 dudes with box cutters? How fucking stupid do you have to believe? And I'm, am I calling a, a lot of people? Yeah, I'm calling you fucking stupid. In, in Celtic, you know, it's it's fairy stories. Hey, man, I love fairy stories like the, the rest of you. But that that's that one's that one's a that one's a real special one there. Look at the Gulf of Tonka. Look at the Gulf of Tonkin. Look at the Levon affair. Look at the USS Liberty. I know survivors of the Liberty. They love me because they know I'll continue talking about it. Who carried that out? How about how about the fucking war that we almost had with JFK, which everybody seems to forget? We're on the verge of that right now. We are on the verge of World War III right now. This little game we're playing with Putin, who, by the way, isn't confused. They're not confused about what a man is over there. No, no, no. Russians know what a man or a woman is. They, they truly do. They're not very progressive. Who's building more churches and mosques in this world right now than anybody else? Putin. Putin. Am I going to say that I love Putin and he's the, he, I'll tell you what, that man has more honor in his fucking pinky than Joe Biden or Rishi Sunak has in their entire body. When you listen to that man talk, it makes sense. But when you're a mind controlled, stupid, willfully ignorant population, who's making a little bit too much money and a little too comfortable, I've said it, I say it again, comfort is the real enemy. That's why we should seek discomfort. Put yourself in uncomfortable positions Become comfortable, become capable in uncomfortable positions. Because when you get really comfortable, you know, now you don't want to risk your comfort. Like, well, no, don't rock the boat. Like, no. But when you're uncomfortable, like the people on the street, look at the homeless out there. This country, it's dripping with money, dripping with money. And there's homeless everywhere, many of them veterans as well. And we turn a blind eye. If you go back to Germany under the Weimar German Republic, where the Deutschmark was worth nothing, that's where we're going right now. 
That is where we are going right now. And people who, the divide between rich and poor, the gap, where's that going? How do we accept this? How did we ever accept? I remember thinking as in my 20s, like, you know, we didn't really have billionaires back then. You know, they, they were like hundreds of millions was like kind of top at that point. But I remember thinking like, why doesn't one of these like multi, multi millionaires like just take a few mil or, you know, a hundred mil out of his little budget and leave six, seven hundred, hundred million left and go feed these starving people. Or, or maybe I've said it in Iran on a lecture I gave, like if I had billions of dollars, you know, what the first thing I would do is clean drinking water for everybody, everyone. They don't have that in Gaza, by the way, clean drinking water. Why is it that humanity is so far gone that we're happy if we're in our own little private Idaho, we're happy to turn a blind eye to any atrocity and then even excuse ourselves or deny the fact that when I went out, when you go out and buy this avion in this country right now, there's some tax on that. Where's that tax going? That's going to genocide right there. That's a fact. We are funding genocide. We are complicit with genocide and our representatives literally they represent us this is not a dictatorship right these representatives they represent the will of the people you know the democracy that represents the will of its people more than any other i'll end it with this like you know which nation has a democracy that actually it's not really a democracy but let's just say that it is let's go ahead and accept their argument that it is do you know what nation respects the will of its people more than any other nation literally israel because you know what the populace, the constituents of Israel want? 85% plus want them to X Gaza, to forcefully displace or even nuke. They've said it. Amalek, remember Amalek, we're dealing with human animals. 85%, think about that. How many people here in this country would prefer to see a ceasefire and an end to the war? Can we safely say it's a majority? But why are all the politicians excusing genocide and, and making excuses for Israel? Wait, why? Is this Israel? Are we in Israel? Are we in England? I'm sorry. Why is our policy so lockstep in line with the Jewish state of Israel? And my, my nation too. And all the other European nations in Australia and New Zealand and all of them. The only ones that aren't is the country where I'm intending to go, Malaysia. They have a prime minister who just came out again at the UN and called it out for what it is. They actually have values over there. And check it out, gay folk. You ain't getting no gay pride month over there. In fact, you better not do no French kissing and like, you know, your little parties and stuff over there. But you can do it in the bedroom if you want. They got different values over there. They don't have alcohol everywhere. You know, where have our values gone? And, and if we get back to it, it's social engineering. It's mind control. It's fear-based. It's, it's, all, it's all stuff that we could change. Fear controls the world, though. See, when you were in the Marines, what sort of stuff were you doing? So, I was an infantryman. Would you have died for your country? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I always say this. When I when I tell my story, I went off to a war. I I actually I have my, my medals and stuff. I, yeah, because you were in the Gulf War. Was it 1990? Yeah, I was in Operation Desert Storm. Uh, uh, Operation, um, uh, we liberated Kuwait. Um, which funny enough, that's about as, as noble a war as you could, you know, there's, it's not, but it's about as close as we get it. Funny enough. And that war was a soft war compared to like, I, my, my dear mate in uh, Virginia who lives there, Marcus, um, he was in Afghanistan for the second, uh, the, the war on terror, right? Stepped on a landmine in Afghanistan, <laughs> legs gone like that. I asked him uh, in the last few months if he could go back, would he just like step over that way, <laughs> you know? And you know what he said? He honestly said, he said, no. He said, no, because I, I wouldn't be the man I am today. So that, that, that young brother of mine, 20 years my junior, values his ethics and his understanding and his commitment to God more than his legs. Most people wouldn't be willing to give up their three-car garage uh, to, to feed uh, a large number of people or stop a genocide. They want the penthouse, and now they want the better building. This is materialism. I've said it forever. Once you covet the material, 
Satan already has you. He already has you. But if you are, I said it in this film, Europa, The Last Battle, which is the most censored film on the planet, along with the greatest story never told, um, some of us operate on a level, level that goes beyond the material. Th they say every man has a price? Bullshit. Bullshit. There isn't enough money in the fucking world to pay me to turn my back on my God and, and humanity. You know, I have kids too. But even if I didn't, what about the kids? What, fuck them? What are we leaving? Our parents messed up too, by the way. <laughs> they left us this mess, you know? Like, I don't. I, I want to be the generation that that either died in the battle to to affect the change or made the change. And that is my goal. I mean, I, I gave a lecture not long ago with Sheikh Imam Hussein, and I literally cried when I thought about it because I want to be, able, before I die, if I have the chance, if I'm not ripped to shreds, skinned alive with my fucking tattooed body put up on a raw child's wall. Um, <laughs> <literally>. <laughs> Well, we go going up. <laughs> uh, hey, man, I don't underestimate what those bastards will do to me if they do, if, if they get their chance. You know, God protects me and I'll accept whatever comes my way. But, um, you know, the day that, that I, I never expected to see, I ain't entitled to shit, but I, I can see it. And it's ironic because this genocide that's being carried out now, you got to be a special kind of inhuman to not see this, man. Like, come on. There's over 15,000 dead kids. Most of the people there are dead. They have literally taken 2,000 pound bombs supplied by my birth nation, paid for by U.S. taxpayers, and they have taken out entire buildings. There are stories and videos of children. You'd have to be inhuman not to feel the pain. Even if you're a supporter of Israel, surely you must have some humanity in you. Are not the kids innocent? Do we not have at least this amount of decency left in our own society? Well, it would seem that many do not. They covet the material more than they actually care about their own humanity. And they reject God in their own way. And they basically have taken the hand of Satan, who offers all of the seductive enticements of materialism. This town epitomizes it. And here I am under investigation <laughs> for hate speech. And uh, supporting a prescribed group, Hamas. And I didn't even say Hamas. I condemn all war crimes. Uh, who's the biggest war criminal? My birth nation. I've said that for over 20 years. Uh, I've always condemned it. I've served notice of that effect many times over. Um, I'm against that. I, I condemn it. And there's rules in war. You don't kill prisoners. You don't rape uh, women. You don't kill children. You don't destroy crops. You, you don't do these things. Um, and there's rules. If you, any, anyone who violates those, go fuck yourself, you, you bitch. Did you ever kill anyone? No, no. And I thank God for that every time, because I've said this over and over too. Amongst those that have come back from these illegal, immoral wars, none of our wars have been defensive. Name me a defensive war. We, we haven't had no defensive wars. They're all offensive wars. They're all based on lies. They're all about global spectrum dominance, the project for a new American century, rebuilding America's defenses. I could give lectures on this stuff. I'm writing books about it. But, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is that, that war is a racket, as the best Marine ever, General Smedley Butler, wrote in his book, War is a Racket. That's a 30-year Marine who had two Congressional Medals of Honor. If anybody would know what the Marines were about, um, it would be him. I know, too. The war that I was sent off to, um, we had pummeled them by air uh, for, for over a month. We were I was living in a hole in the ground in Saudi Arabia on the border of Kuwait. Didn't take a shower for a month. My hair was like a rock, you know, when I finally got to try and shower. And uh, when the ground war started, and we went in through with Amtrak's per armored personnel carriers. I didn't sleep for three days. The SAS set the oil fires, by the way. They say Saddam didn't know. That was the British SAS that did that. I know that. So the British SAS set the oil fires to be blamed on Saddam, and that toxic smoke is what I breathed for three days straight, where it was black as midnight in the midday sun of Kuwait. Black as midnight. Imagine being outside right now and having it be black as midnight. That'd be a bit trippy, wouldn't it? But it was that way from the smoke of the fires. The, when we went through, and I didn't sleep for three days, and I wasn't tired at all, the adrenaline was flowing. They were all surrendering or dead. 
Um, so we had no resistance. We did take some shots. I remember some bullets flying by, but it was pro probably friendly fire. Who knows? Um, I what never... Is, what is friendly fire? So, uh, in, in fact, we actually had a guy who was shot, or he thought he was. He actually, someone shot. It could have been the enemy, but I, I suspect it was guys behind us. One of our own guys, being trigger happy, fired his weapon, ended up hitting one of the guys in my unit, um, hit his canteen. So the canteen started emptying out. It was dark. And he reached back. He's like, oh, I've been shot. I've been shot. He hadn't been shot. His canteen had been shot and the water was emptying out. And he touched the water. He thought it was blood. <laughs> it's like, so, um, you know, that's friendly fire. Anyway, um, we, 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 we didn't really encounter any resistance. Again, I thank you, God. Thank you so much. <clears throat> that war was a soft war. The war that my brother Marcus was in and so many others, uh, that was much more dirty. It was a lot of urban warfare, which is fighting in like city environments. This, not, I mean, jungle warfare has its own trades. Uh, desert warfare has its own trades. Mountain warfare. But but urban combat, is it, it really sucks. Really, really sucks. And uh, 22 a day were committing suicide from the U.S. military. 22 a day for over 15 years. Why? You know why? That's why I thank God that I never killed anybody because I'm not so stupid that I wouldn't have realized at some point that I was in someone else's land. And if I came from that land and some bully nation with this crazy power who covered, covets our mineral wealth or our oil in this case, if I was a young man of 19 in that country and, and some other country came and invaded my country, what would I do? What would I do if I was Palestinian? Fine. What would I do? Yeah. Would I lie on the sidelines and, and say, oh, I'm sick? No. I would fight and I would kill. Absolutely. I would do what a man does. I would do my duty. I would defend against the bully. I've always fought bullies. So I didn't kill anybody, and that's my saving grace. Because if I had killed somebody, much less a child, war is, you don't want your, they glorify war. We've got war fucking memorials everywhere all over this place. It's not fucking glorious. Even as kids, though, I remember playing with tanks and little soldiers. So you're being programmed from a very young age to normalise war, to normalise shootings. I love playing with little tanks. Like yeah. I said earlier, I tried to join the Marines at 18. I wanted an escape. Thank fuck I didn't. Don't know, maybe my life would have been just as good, but I would have loved the chaos. My life was chaos then, so I would have loved the brotherhood and the chaos, and I would never have... I, would have, I love easy as well. So if I've got brothers on the same kind of page, I would have loved them, died for them, yeah. killed for them. Yeah. Um, but that's just the way life is. But wars, like we said earlier, 10,000 wars there's been since the start of mankind. Um, and we go through all the playbooks and all the history and that's all there. Like why? What's your theory on why wars exist? You know the only winner in war? They love war too. Bankers. Bankers. The head of the snake. <laughs> I will continue to bring it back to the head of the snake. It's part of my optimism because... Henry Kissinger, a Jew, uh, he said it very honestly. I appreciate that that Jewish man for he's dead now. I know he ain't up in heaven. That's for damn sure. That's the guy who engineered the the carpet bombing of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, where we napalmed and and bombed with just insanity, pure insanity. Remember, we've all seen that picture of the the, the Vietnamese girl running like all the clothes have been burned off her, and she's screaming like that epic photo. That's Henry Kissinger, a Jew, who engineered that. And um, he said, the military are nothing but dumb animals to be used. Thank you, Henry, for that honest statement. That's very true. We are dumb animals to be used. I realized after, you know, having studied and, you know, being betrayed by the Marines that I was an idiot. I literally signed away my freedom when I enlisted I, on the dotted line. Not only did I sign my freedom away, I literally became government property. Literally. We are like government property. Literally. Literally. And all of that was my control. So here's the beauty, right? This is the beauty of what happened to me. I was indoctrinated. Now, I may not have been the, you know, as stupid as some, some of the Yanks, right? It was really blindingly stupid. But I was a firm knower, 
that my country's the greatest. I knew that. I knew that. Of course. And if anybody said otherwise, them's fighting words. <laughs> you know? Fuck America. If you said that in front of me as a kid, boy, we'd be fighting. Man. So I knew that I was right. And I knew that my country was the greatest and so on and so forth. But when I was betrayed by the Marines after being able and willing to give everything for the Marines, that was a betrayal that I had two years, by the way, after I spoke out, I had two more years in the Marines. People don't understand. Two years in the Marine Corps infantry going off to war and going out into the field. I had a tick grab onto my balls, came out of the field. I had to try and take that son of a bitch off my balls going into swarms of mosquitoes, wearing camo paint, living a life that's really horrendous with a guy in charge of you who hated you. By the time I came out, my mind had been unlocked. Here, all that indoctrination, all that indoctrination that made me know that my country's the greatest, freedom and democracy, rah, rah. I knew that was bullshit. All of that, bam, gone because of the betrayal of what happened to me in the Marines. My mind was now open. It was a vessel ready to receive, no longer a filter of mind control, socially engineered on all of us to one degree or another. I was infected with a supremacist ideology. That's what Americans are. They are supremacists. They believe they're better. They believe their lives are worth more. The British have the same supremacist. Like when we heard about those three aid workers uh, that, remember, that got killed over there in Gaza, the whole country was out. Fuck the 15, 16,000 Palestinian kids, eh? Yeah, they don't count, do they? Oh, we're so fucking precious. Even things like that that would go under the radar of the normal person. Like, do you not understand how sick and twisted this society is that you value the lives of your own people, and then we can take that further, extrapolate that further. You know, the white man maybe values white life more than, than the Pakistani life and, and then the Muslim value, whatever. You know, everybody's like in their own, what the hell? Are we, is this the best we got? Are we actually civilized? Has, has anybody ever looked at that word civilized? Take a look at it. Go, go look in the damn dictionary and read civilized. What the fuck is civilized about it? Barbaric is what we are. Western barbarity. Yeah, Britain's invaded over 90% of the world. Yes. We're yes. one of the worst. The sun never sets. It's fucking over 90% of the world. We, we colonized so many countries, and this some of them just got shut back just a few years ago. America's not the power. Yeah. Where does no, it the, all, America's the muscle. You talk about the king, the, the head of the snake. What is the head of the snake? City here? of London. City of London. That's where all the banking is. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, and that's part of why I pissed off some powerful Jews here, no doubt about it. As I say that, right, I know, I, I hate the fact that we have to qualify this. It's the Jewish state of Israel committing genocide against my people. And I, I, I can't hold my tongue about it. Like, fuck Israel. Fuck America, too. Fuck both of you. You bastards. What you do is ungodly. It's It's inhuman. It's, it's the epitome of a bully on steroids, armed with nukes. You, you're shooting fish in a barrel in Gaza. They have no army, navy, air force. They have no airport. They have no money. They have nothing. They're captive, and you shoot them with a barrel, and my birth nation supplies the weapons, and now American troops on the ground. Shame on us all. Really shame on us all. Like I said, like for me, you know... <laughs> I, I don't care, man. I don't fear. I, only two things scare me, big waves and women. <laughs> Literally. I, I'm a surfer, so I'm telling you, when you're looking at a 30-foot wave coming at you, I don't, I don't care how big it looks on the shore. When, you, when you're in the water and you're looking at that thing, you know it's going to break in front of you. Like, it's going to scare you. Because uh, Britain, did they colonize uh, Palestine? Did they own Palestine? 100%. Until yep. 1948, 1947? Yes. Okay, but Is see, that true? Yeah, yes. Balfour, it became so the Ottomans had it. The Ottomans, which is Muslims, they had it. Uh, but then with the World War One agenda, which was instigated by nefarious interests, I have to say it, the most censored film on the planet, Europa The Last Battle. The most frightening documentary on the planet 
which yours truly happens to be the first thing you see in that film. And I had nothing to do with the production, but I do nail it. I do nail it. It's getting back to what, what I was saying earlier. Some of us operate beyond the level of the material. Most people in this society operate on the material level. They will do a nine to five job that they hate just so they can have the money to go out and get plastered drunk, snort some coke, maybe, you know, have sex with a hooker or whatever, an escort. Literally, literally, people are living like that. They're so intoxicated by the material. Me uh, and, and me, I know too many people who, who don't look at it that way. We have a very different perspective. If, if you are not enamored by the material, then they cannot control you. If you have a connection to source, God, uh, the creator, whatever you want to call it, the beginning, you know, if you have any connection to that and acknowledge an eternal soul, once again, what would be more precious than your soul, man? Whatever price you might pay in a human life, I think the thing that people should be afraid of is not making the most of your life. Quality, quantity. Which one do I want? Quality. I'll take one day of quality, whether it's a relationship, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a taste of freedom, real freedom, like to walk around and be who you are, to not have to put up a mask, to try and remember the lie I said to this person over here, because, uh, you know, to just be who you are, to walk this world as I do. I'm a blessed man. <laughs> I'm a blessed man. I'm as free a man as walks this earth. Why is Israel and Palestine getting so much media attention, though? Because you look at Congo, the stuff that's happening in there, and there's no media attention towards it whatsoever. Yes. Um, well, the Jews control the media. Uh, the truth is anti-Semitic. You know, literally, I'm, I'm writing that book, too. I've got so many books. I, I can list 100 things that, if you say it, like I'm saying it here, that's anti-Semitic. But is it true? Who controls the banks? Getting back to this country and the Ottomans and Palestine, right? Everybody who knows anything knows that the Rothschilds, the money changers, very famously, this is not completely unknown. This is largely known. I, you, I try and gauge consciousness and I talk to people and I've talked to a lot of people, just everyday people, they know this. Back in the days of Napoleon, and the wars uh, that were being fought between the British and the French and all of this territorial dispute and whatnot. Very famously, the Rothschilds took control of this uh, country uh, at the very latest in the 1700s. The way they do it is by lending money at interest, usury, which is not acceptable in Islam or Christianity, but look at all the dumbass Christians and who don't know this. Jesus got pissed when he came out of the temple and he saw the banksters of the day, the Pharisees, doing their dirty usury business. Not only did Jesus come out and upturn the tables, literally spilling their money everywhere, he took out a whip. And, and this is not some fairy story. This, is a, this man Jesus lived. He was not some hippie. He was not. He was a warrior. Look at the man. He, he, Mel Gibson, God bless you for the passion of the Christ. He whipped these bastards. He whipped them. Usury is the worst of all crimes. We'll, we can get into that. The bottom line is that since the Napoleonic Wars, the, the Rothschilds were lending money to nations at interest, which is a way bigger loan than a personal loan, like when you get a loan to buy a car or whatever. This country is now seven trillion pounds in debt to the bankers. They, this country can never pay it back. Where's inflation going? Up. Is it going to go down? No. It's going to keep going up. But you wouldn't look at a place like Germany, because all we know about Germany is what they told us about Germany. Six million gas chambers, Mr. Evil, Hitler. Yeah, right. Okay. Nothing to see there. Yeah, there is something to see there. Germany was on its knees in a worse position than us. Way worse. Their money was worth nothing. It took a wheelbarrow of Deutschmarks to buy a loaf of bread. Germans were starving. Two million were unemployed, uh, no, six million unemployed, two million homeless. You could go to Berlin and buy a mother and daughter for sex. You could have a bestial, bestiality was going on, lesbianism and homosexuality. All of that was going on. In 1933, a man named Adolf, and this is where I got to say it. There's a lesson there. This is why I say it. As Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Nothing but the truth will set us free. Believing lies will get us nowhere. It's their game. That's why they don't want you to look over there. 
In 1933, Judea declares war on Germany. Adolf Hitler was the only popularly democratically elected leader in all of Europe. Winston Churchill wasn't. None of them were. Only Adolf. 1933, he's only just come to power in a coalition government. Judea declares war on Germany. 14 million Jews of the world unite calling for the destruction of Germany. How many people know that? That might be relevant. That might be relevant. If Judea declares war on Germany, that might be relevant. Did Judea declare war on, on Palestine? Oh, they say Hamas. What are they doing? They're genociding my family over there. The same Judea, the Jewish state of Israel. We're not allowed to say that. When Adolf came to power, six million unemployed, two million homeless, crime off the charts, pedophilia rampant, debauchery and the sexual enslavement of humanity and the just completely debauched Berlin was the moral cesspool capital of the world. Within five years of taking power, this bankrupt, starving nation had the highest wages in Europe, zero unemployment, zero homeless, free homes. All you had to do was get married, have one kid, 25% of the usury free loan wiped out, two kids, 50%, three kids, 75%, four kids. You had a free home with an acre of land and the condition was that you had a half acre plot to grow food. Why was that? To be self-sufficient. What are we doing to our farmers here? What are they doing to the farmers in, in the Netherlands? They're cutting our food supply. When people have no access to food, oh, that'll never, yes, it is going to happen. Yes, it is. And it happened, but nothing to see over there. Nothing to see back then in the 1930s Germany that became the most prosperous, highest standard of living, highest wages, six weeks mandatory vacation on cruise ships that weren't allowed into this country because the British did not want, the leaders did not want the British people to see how good the Germans had it. All of that he achieved, and he outlawed usury. Adolf Hitler outlawed usury. You know who else did that? Oh, a guy named Muammar Gaddafi did that. Oh, shit, something bad happened to him. Abraham Lincoln did that. Too. Oh, shit, he got shot in the head, too. Oh, John F. Kennedy did. Oh, shit, he got shot in the head, too. Seems like everybody who touches the money and usury, Jesus got crucified, didn't he? If Jesus were here today and he said what he said, quote, the synagogue of Satan, he'd be in prison for anti-Semitism. I'd probably be hanging out with Jesus in the cell under investigation for terrorism and anti-Semitism. Everything I have just said is true. I I'm going to do it on this show, and uh, you, this is going to get tons of views, and I tell you what, you'll get some heat for it, but the bottom line is this. I will debate anyone, anyone on this planet. I say it to you, the camera too, anyone. I will debate your best on World War II and a man named Adolf. There you go. I was meaning to hold off on this shit, but you know what? It, we don't have time. We don't have time. And the truth is truth. For me, truth is God and God is truth. Satan is lies and illusion. That's what all this is. It's one big illusion. Negative energy. Truth what is God. What started World War II then? Was Hitler, he not, was he not a painter at the start? And then they say he was gay and then he was on drugs and that as well. Like what's yeah. the, I don't really know it, if I'm honest. Well, here's, but yeah. What happened before World War II and who was Hitler? You know, in my studies, uh, I've read Mein Kampf. I've also read Leon de Grill, um, David Irving, an absolute, like the quintessential British historian. God bless him. His career was destroyed. Everybody who touches this, I've been assassinated. I've been dead on the ground. I've been tortured. I've been thrown in one of the worst prisons in the world for a six-day visa overstay. Um, they don't reward us for speaking these truths. Uh, that's a fact. But whatever, man, I ain't backing down. That's just the way it is, man. I, like Patrick Henry said, give me liberty, give me death. Adolf Hitler was born in Austria, and his father was very hard man, tough man, uh, Alois. Um, he, he, he beat him and, you know, he, but it was a tough time. So it wasn't like he was, he was, uh, he was not a loving father. He was a very hard father. Adolf loved his mother. People don't know this, but I know it. Adolf was forever grateful to a doctor that helped save his mother and relieve her pain. She died quite young for him, but it was a Jewish doctor. And he, he loved that doctor till the day he died as well. Nobody knows that. I do. So. 
Adolf was homeless. Uh, his parents had died and he was homeless as a struggling artist who tried to get into the Austria Art, Insist Art Institute. He tried twice. They didn't take him. He literally was homeless. He lived in hostels in, in, uh, you know, I have 71 things in common with Adolf Hitler, by the way. I've also been homeless. I'm also Catholic. I also had an abusive father. I had a mother I love. I can go on and on and on. I didn't realize it until I kept reading. I'm like, holy shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, then World War I started, and he signed up. So he was like homeless drifter, but then he signed up. He found his purpose in the military. He fought valiantly. Uh, he earned the Iron Cross. Uh, silver and gold. Uh, he he was very decorated, but he wasn't promoted as much as he should have been. Same same to, same as me. He made it to Lance Corporal. I made it to Lance Corporal. He fought in the trenches. He was injured three different times. Three of those, all three of those times, he could have stayed home or at least in the rear with the gear. He did not. He he insisted to go back to the front. The third time, he adopted a dog. In, in, in the war, in the trenches, World War I, one of the worst wars ever with gas, he, he was vegetarian. Adolf Hitler was a vegetarian, Mr. Madman. Why would, I, I'm vegetarian for 30 years as well. Why am I vegetarian? Because I ain't paying for another creature to be slaughtered and, and tortured when I don't need to. I'm healthy. Do I need to? No. I make that choice. God knows I made that choice. Do I have a problem with people eat meat in a right context and with an animal that's farm proper? No, but that's not the factory farm. So anyway, this vegetarian madman, highly decorated guy also was gassed by the Brits. He was gassed. He went blind. And a lot of people get depressed and want to kill themselves because they think they're never going to see again. And, and he didn't know if he would. It was when he was gassed um, and he was back in the hospital blind that he got the news that the German uh, Kaiser had abdicated. And this is what they call in, in, in real history the, the great stab in the back. So Adolf had fought valiantly. He had been in war. And he, had, he, he not only did his nation lose a war that it easily could have won, yeah, honestly. It, it, again, David Irving would tell you this too. But anyway, um, they lost the war. But not only that. The German Kaiser abdicated, and that's where the Weimar German Republic took over. Now, the modern equivalent of that is where these financiers go into little third world countries and they develop some big dam or some electrical power plant, right? And they sell it as like, oh, we're going to have electricity and it's going to provide all this fantastic infrastructure increase for... But what's the reality of it? The reality of it is that the bankers, the financiers, give the loan... And then the contractors associated with the financiers go in and build the power plant or the dam or whatever. That loan is unpayable. Now, the corrupt politicians within these third world countries, they get their backhanders. So they're all living in villas, having a good old time. But the people end up being saddled with a debt that's not payable. And we see the poverty of the world. This, this pattern has been told over and over. Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Great book. Talks all about it. Anyway, Germany became a non-sovereign state when they lost world war one all of their gold was stolen by the banksters they had like 500 million deutsche marks or something in gold all of that was stolen they were saddled with a reparations debt that literally was like money from germans that was going to pay like reparations to all the other nations and ultimately the weimar german republic was jewish bankers debt that took Germany from a powerful, um, threatening country because the Germans have always threatened the Franco-English domination. And they've always been like kind of a thorn in the side that they couldn't control. And anyway, from, from the end of World War I to, up until 1933, we see the Adolf Hitler basically like me. I felt betrayed. Uh, I felt my nation was, had done not me wrong, but, but the whole nation wrong. I, I saw the veterans committing suicide. He saw this too. And he wrote a book called Mein Kampf when he was imprisoned for treason, where they let him out after he did this incredible speech in his trial. He wrote Mein Kampf. He said, listen, this is our problem. The enemy is inside the gate. It's not the, it's not Putin. It's not Iran. It's not even China. No, 
The enemy is right here in the gate, pulling the strings of power through the money. Anyway, 1933 comes along. That's where I, I, I return back to how Adolf won. He had written Mein Kampf. Uh, he was a war hero. He was also against war, and he had no problem with the British. He didn't like communists. I don't like communism either. If anybody wants to study history, study Bolshe Bolshevism. Study the, what they call the Russian Revolution. Study Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who writes about this. It wasn't a Russian Revolution. It was an invasion financed by Jewish interests from America. They took $500 million worth of gold. At that time, we're talking the early 1900s, $500 million worth of gold supplied by the J.P. Morgan Rothschild interests, Rockefeller interests, to the invaders who are the same people that are now committing genocide in Palestine. The people committing that genocide over there have no blood ties to that land. They don't. They come from a place called Khazaria in Eastern Europe. They don't even speak a Semitic language. They speak Yiddish. So these are not people from that region. The people that invaded Russia, which was a Christian nation, similar to how Russia is Christian now. Hmm. Gee. What did they do to the Christians in Russia when the Bolshevik revolution, the Bolshevik invasion occurred, financed by Jewish interests? They killed the, the, the Tsar and his family, Anastasia. That's fairly well known by many people. They executed them and they killed all of the priests. All of, of the churches and mosques were destroyed. Guess what was still left standing in the newly formed Soviet Union? Synagogues remained standing. So they killed all the Christians. They destroyed all the churches and mosques. The synagogues remained standing. And the first law of the Soviet commun communist nation, the Soviet Union, was anti-Semitism. Guess what the punishment for anti-Semitism was in the Soviet Union? Death. Alexander Solzhenitsyn writes about this. Who did we ally with in World War II? Who did we ally with in this great war where the good guys, us, won the war? Who did we ally with? So we allied with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was married to a Jew and his policies were Jewish instigated, who knew about Pearl Harbor before it happened and did not inform the troops who were sacrificed in Pearl Harbor. All fact. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a drunkard named Winston Churchill, and um, a guy named, uh, well, FDR, Franklin Delano referred to him as Uncle Joe. You may know him as Joe Stalin. Joe Stalin, undeniably, official history makes clear, 40 million he killed, he starved in the Soviet Union. No God, no private property, anti-Semitism, first law, death. We, the good guys, so-called Christian nations of America and Britain, allied with communism, no God, no religion, no private property, anti-Semitism, Joe Stalin, murderer of 40 million. And we're the good guys, are we? And we fought a nation that outlawed usury, outlawed Freemasonry, Adolf Hitler arrested a Rothschild. He ended unemployment. He ended the depravity of the of the uh, of the money being worth nothing. He created the highest wages in Europe, the highest standard of living in Europe. Provided free homes to families as long as they lived in the home. You couldn't rent out the home. You had if you didn't live in the home, you didn't need the home. So some German needed the home. That's how they eliminated homelessness. He outlawed usury, outlawed Freemasonry, arrested a raw child, ended the poverty, ended the crime, protected the children, and uh, was loved by his people. And us good guys had to stop that with Uncle Joe Stalin, murderer of 40 million, and drunkard Winston Churchill. And we firebombed Dresden, we firebombed Berlin, we firebombed Hamburg, we laid waste to all of Germany, we destroyed tons of amazing art, you know, cultural, valuable sites, and we're the good guys. And who told us that history? The same ones genociding my family in Gaza. What about Gaddafi? Gaddafi, I have the Green Book. I didn't bring it with me. I've read it before. Um, I highly recommend the Green Book. Um, his death was horrendous for those that know him. He oh. tried to change the dollar and bring in, uh, he, he was good for healthcare women who were given birth. 
housing, education, like a lot of good things that he'd done. Um, but is that the same then? Yes. Are you talking, I'm not educated enough with the Hitler kind of side of things. I've got a rough understanding of it, but um, I know Gaddafi done a lot of good, but I know he was trying to get away from the dollar, is what I'm he led did. to believe. He was. And that's why he was killed, is that correct? Yes, it is. And and right now, actually, Saudi Arabia is coming off the petrodollar. They're imploding the Western economy. America's definitely in a... <laughs> this country, too. UK's on its ass. It's, it's, Scotland's it's, on its ass. It's they've, over. They've got, you can't even speak out against the yeah, trans movement. I know. They're putting trans men in with women in prisons. It's, and it's, it's, it's unbelievable. They, and I always thought Scotland had a bit of balls. I and a bit so of heart. Too. I thought we were okay. Listen, we'll fucking bend a break for no one. But... They're just playing the game as well. Like you say, they're just getting the money to be quiet. I'm not saying anything as long as I don't care if there's destruction and pain it's around really sad, the world, yeah. as long as my bank is getting filled with cash. And the same with Gaddafi, is that the same sort of? Literally, so Gaddafi, when Gaddafi took power, Libya was the poorest nation in all of Africa. It had the highest illiteracy rate. Um, it, it was it was it was on its knees like germany uh when adolf took power by the way jfk john f kennedy uh, was a journalist who traveled uh to germany while adolf was in power and he saw he's like others even uh chamberlain said he's never seen a more happy people when he visited germany under adolf um also jfk's memoirs uh, are very flattering of germany you may have heard of a man named Jesse Owens, uh, a black yeah, athlete. Athlete. I watched his documentary a few weeks ago, actually. Did you see how when yeah. he was he? Because you know where the Olympics were in 1936. In they were in Munich, Berlin. Berlin. So the 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 Olympics in 1936. We got the Olympics going on here now, right? Uh, in France, and uh, so here we are. We have this black man who wins four good gold medals, which is like unheard of. And there were other black athletes too from America. Now I'm going to say this word because uh, I don't give a fuck and political correctness never saved the world. And plus I'm Irish and we were known as the white niggers of Europe. So no, black people don't own that word. And literally there used to be signs in pubs here, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish, up until the 80s at least. Well, that's how the black folk were treated in America at that time. They, they're not the same. They had separate you know, they're not allowed to drink from that water fountain, sit at that counter. But when they went to Germany, you know what all the black athletes said about the Germans that they had been told were these evil, nasty, horrendous bastards? They were showered with love. They were treated with respect. Many of them stayed, actually. When Jesse Owens won his four gold medals, and did you see this in the documentary? You did. Yeah. When he went past the, the chancellor, Adolf, what did he do? The Chancellor, Mr. Master Race, take over the world, exterminate the Jews, blah, blah, blah. He got up and he bowed and paid his respect. And Jesse Owens remembered it. When Jesse Owens went home, did he get to uh, an invitation to Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, White House? No, no, he didn't. Did he get an invitation to any uh, any institution of, of power in America? No, he did not. Did he Did he die with at least respect for being a, 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 the pride of America in terms of winning gold? No, he did not. He died destitute and poor. He did. Do you think America's more racist than Germany? Well, the Germans, here's the truth. Adolf Hitler had 150,000 Jews in his military. Adolf Hitler had a, battal a battalion of black German soldiers. They weren't German, but they volunteered. This, there, used, there was a convention in Madison Square Garden up until they really went hard uh, and like started vilifying it and criminalizing any support for National Socialism. National Socialism is the answer. It, it, and, it, and even that, beg, it's not socialism as we understand. Socialism, National Socialism is like social justice. So, for instance, as I mentioned before, in order to eliminate uh, homelessness, you could not get a home. Like you have four kids, you get a home, you build a home. Now you want to go live over in some other country or some other part of Germany and then you rent out. You couldn't do that. If, you, if you're not living in the home, you don't need the home. Can you understand? Do you know how many vacant buildings there are in, in this town right here with this homeless problem we got going? 
You know how many rich people have holiday homes and different flats in this city right here? That did not exist in Germany because it's social justice. So anyway, Gaddafi emulated what Adolf did. He also outlawed usury, Gaddafi. He also built like the Autobahn, which created jobs and, and created transport abilities for the Germans. That road still sits there today. It is. I've driven the Autobahn. Have you ever driven it? It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And it, it cooperates with the, 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 the landmarks and, and the, uh, the nature. It doesn't like cut through and pfft. no, it actually respects nature. Um, Gaddafi built a canal, an amazing engineering feat from sub-Saharan Africa where there's water and brought all of that through the Sahara Desert into Libya. Why did he do that? To bring in water so that they could become an agricultural society and be self-sufficient. Same as Adolf once again. What are they doing to the farmers today? Oh, the opposite. Yeah. So I guess we don't need to be self-sustained, right? No, apparently not. They'll all have food. I think the Rothschilds will be sorted on food and stuff. I think they'll be okay. Anyway, he brought water in. If you got married under Gaddafi, you got 50K to start the family. If you, if you, uh, if you wanted a home, you, you were able to get a home for uh, virtually nothing. If you wanted to be a farmer, you got a free home and land to farm the land. And seeds. And seeds and water, all of it subsidized. If you had uh, education and you got a scholarship like they do in Gaza, I met kids uh, 16 years ago who had scholarships, some of them to like, uh, Rhodes, uh, Rhodes scholars, you know, like the Ivy League schools and stuff, they had been improved, but they couldn't get out in, in literally like that's been happening for donkeys years over there. Can you imagine being that good, you know, and, and, and having a scholarship to some amazing institution that would ensure that you would have an income that would be able to take care of your family, not being able to do it or people in Gaza that have been denied the ability to get out of Gaza, to get medical, uh, medical care. That's not, doesn't exist there. Um, they die. You know how many have died like that? Tons, tons. They don't count, do they? So Gaddafi um, also, uh, he, he made gas uh, for cooking and free, free. Petrol was like, uh, was like 11p a liter or something. Um, it would became the most literate nation in all of Africa. It became the wealthiest nation in all of Africa. It had a population that loved Gaddafi. Only in the eastern part where you had real tribal stuff was there some that didn't like him. But all of Tripoli came out. I have a video actually from my old YouTube channel that got more views than any other video I put out. And it's about Gaddafi. It's like a, a drum and bass uh, track to Gaddafi driving in an open top vehicle through Tripoli, being accosted with love from his people. Can, they won't let none of, I mean a little bit more here but Joe Biden ain't gonna be <laughs> Joe Biden was in Maui when I was there a year ago you know they had fuck Biden signs and everything like they fucking hate him who wouldn't hate that kid touching piece of shit traitor so anyway yeah Gaddafi very much took the lead and they they offed him too boy well, Saddam Hussein as well, weapons of mass destruction. There was no weapons of mass destruction. What about the six million Jews in the gas chamber that everybody's led to believe in? Hitler was a bad man and the worst of its kind. Like you're taught that in the schooling system, especially in the UK. And um, you're taught about the history of World War One, World War Two. Hitler was a fucking evil man. Mm. Um, but what about the six million? A lot of people say the numbers are a lot less. Um, but a lot of people aren't educated enough to they just believe what they see in textbooks, and that's okay because they don't question enough. But what about the six million Jews that people say that's evil? The the most act, look, you know, for people who just whatever. If you're gonna go ahead, because I don't give a fuck about popularity. In a collectively insane world, why would I want to be popular? Why? Why? When the world is sane and has values, okay, then then I'll be happy to be popular. Otherwise, I don't give a shit. So if people want to just parrot, if they think popularity has anything to do with knowledge or wisdom, whatever, you're an idiot. It has nothing to do with it. Most people are fucking stupid, willfully ignorant, whether you believe it or not. No serious historian, no serious historian even begins to claim this six million figure. If you even just did the math, 
Do you know how many Jews you'd have to kill to hit that 6 million figure? In, in the period that we're talking, it's like 41 to 45. So you're talking 365 days times four. That's 1,200 days. Do the math. <laughs> 6 million in those many days. Because there's no accusation of him doing that shit until the you know concentration camp, blah, 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 blah. And that's a whole other story. I learned about the concentration camps and the gas chambers from a Jew. I did. In the 90s. His name is David Cole. Everybody, go Google David Cole. A Jewish kid. Raised on a diet in America of the Holocaust. But this Jewish kid, God bless him, he just had some problems. I guess he was kind of a critical thinker too. And you know, if you're going to tell me something, then I need to see the evidence to support it. And he started to see in this diet of the Holocaust that like, okay, where's the evidence for that? And as he looked, he, he had questions. So what did, did this Jewish kid do? In the 90s, keeping in mind that video editing back then was very expensive. Like it's not like now. To be able to get a camera and have a computer and video edit and do all, <laughs> was a lot of money. Jews have money, so yeah, whatever, he had the money. <laughs> he went to Poland, which is where Auschwitz, everybody's heard of Auschwitz, the death camp. And he got a private tour, a private tour. And he, he's wearing his yarmulke and everything. Like, and he speaks like a Jew. He's definitely a Jew, right? And he gets this private tour. And as he's being taken along the tour, it fast, be it fast becomes obvious that he knows more about the actual history of the buildings and uh, the likelihood of them being able to be used for what they say they were used for and so on and so forth to the point that the private tour guide says, acknowledges like, you know what, you really should, you need to speak to the director of the museum. It's a museum now, right? It's a cash cow is what it is. And so he does, he's allowed to actually film with the director of the museum to ask about the so-called gas chambers, right? Now, I could get into a lecture about this, but I'll, I'll give you the, the tidbits that David Cole, a Jew, taught me when I went way back, way back. He Basically, if, if you use this Zyklon B, right, to kill people, first off, this is ridiculous, man. I mean, if you stick people in a gas chamber, gas them, now what? Why don't you just like dig a ditch, fucking bury them in a ditch alive or put a bullet in them? I mean, that's way quicker, a lot quicker. Stick them in a chamber, <laughs> gas them, which by the way, takes energy because you have to heat up the Zyklon B. You'd have to warm it up to activate it, to get it to work. The doors inside the gas chamber, they opened in, they opened inward. Like, like, and there was no lock. The, the lock was on the inside. <laughs> This is not. This is no bullshit. I'm not making this up. The so-called hatches in the top, where they supposedly drop uh, the the gas, were constructed after the Soviets liberated it. Liberated it. They put that in. There's walls inside. These were offices. <laughs> they were offices, and you can see that David Cole points all of that out, and and the director of the museum himself acknowledges that yes, the the buildings were altered. So there were no gas chambers other than the Zyklon B that was used to de-louse the clothes that they wore. Why did they want to kill the lice and ticks? Because it was diseases that was killing people. These parasites go from host to host and pass on the diseases that was killing people. So the gas chambers were to protect the inmates of the concentration camps like Auschwitz, which had a pool, had a theater, and uh, it seems like everybody survived Auschwitz, literally. They didn't do a very good job, and, and, and six, there weren't even six million Jews in all of Europe, and yet they all seem to have survived. How'd they all survive? And if you look at the best figures, if you're going to study history seriously, if you're going to be an investigator... Like, I've studied investigation, like Michael Pallades. Uh, he does some really great stuff on homicide uh, uh, stories that many can't explain, like Supernatural. Michael Pallades, uh, Missing 411, great stuff. If you want to do an investigation, you have to look for evidence. First off, who had a motive? Okay, so Adolf Hitler has six, uh, 1. 150,000 Jews in the military. He didn't like communists. 
any more than I like communists. I don't like communism. I don't like the enemy inside the gate. I don't like the ones that are doing dirty deals on my behalf and, and taking my family and sending them off to bullshit wars. That's the problem. So he didn't like them, that's for sure. But these so-called concentration camps, I'll tell you, would you rather be in Auschwitz or would you rather be in Gaza? Trust me, you would way rather be in Auschwitz. The accurate figures for how many Jews died in World War II, and I challenge anybody, I challenge any of you, to go ahead and dispute the figures. Go on, go on, because everybody else parroted bullshit. The most accurate figures, you know how we hear about the death count, um, the Jews will say now, like, oh, it's Hamas. We all know, and it's historically provable fact, that the best figures that have existed for the death count in Gaza has been Hamas, which isn't just a fighting wing. They're, they, like, control the hospitals, they do, like, the garbage pickup, the distribution of food. That Hamas is not just a bunch of terrorists running around. It's not. So the figures that we get that are accurate right now about how many have been killed now, which is 40K, um, 16K children, they're Hamas figures. Now they're trying to challenge that because it's looking kind of bad, you know, it's looking kind of bad at this point. The best figures we have for death counts, which means you had, like anybody can say dead. And, and so one side would have an incentive to inflate the numbers. The other side would have, so for instance, Iraq, right? They say 250,000 killed. No, bullshit. Over One to million. two million. Yeah. Two million. Literally. We, we've, even Madeleine Albright, a Jew, who was the Secretary of State, said famously on 60 Minutes interview, in response to the interviewer, a Jew, who asked her about the 500,000 dead children that a UN report verified died from the sanctions, right? The economic sanctions. What was Madeleine Albright's response to this? This is 500,000 dead children that she's acknowledging. Well, we think this is a difficult choice, but we think, we think on balance it was worth it. Okay, wait. So our, our Jewish Secretary of State just said on national television that it was worth it to kill 500,000 Iraqi children. I guess we don't value Iraqi children like we value um, little Johnny or Susie from America or, or, or the UK, right? So the figures of Iraq have been played down by America and Britain, but the real figures are much higher. The most accurate figures we have of how many people died. First off, if you look at census reports, there weren't even 6 million Jews and all. They, like, literally, they would have had to kill every single freaking Jew. Why the lie, though? That number six is a big number for them. Numerology is a big thing. This is how deep the rabbit hole goes. Six, six, six. Do you know how many times six million was said before Adolf and all that? Three. More. Six million, at least three, but it's been used historically over and over. Six, numerology is big. Now, see, this is where you, you start getting into stuff that like people, oh, that's crazy. Oh, no, it's not. Numbers are important. Even like for those Christians or whatever, 666, the number of the beast, Iron Maiden fans, they made a great song, Number of the Beast. Yeah, can of Monster as well. Yes. The line is the 666 as well. The McDonald's sign is number 13, which is important. In yes. Numbers as well. The Star of David, which is actually the Star of Remfan, which is a yeah. satanic star. Starbucks. 666. It's six points. And it's 666. So 666. Six million has been said over and over before. 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 Well before. Early 1900s. Or excuse me, uh, yeah, early 1900s. The most accurate figures we have for um, deaths. World War One is is like uh, yeah, one 17. And about, one and two together is about 60, 80 million. Yeah. Genghis Khan, I think, was they said up to 70, 80 million as well. Yeah. Yeah. We, we never hear about the Armenian Christian genocide, which was 9 million. How about the French genocide in, in Algeria, 10 million? We never hear about that. Um, so the only people that count apparently are this six million, this mythical six million figure that doesn't exist. The best figures we have for death counts, understanding we've already discussed. You know, if you ask, if you ask uh, the the you know 
the Americans, how many died in Iraq, they're going to deflate the numbers, right? In this case, we, we can clearly see they want to inflate the numbers. So they say 6 million, but the best figures we have come from the Red Cross. The Red Cross was the, was the best count we have of how many actual dead bodies. Anybody can say whatever number they want. They can repeat the number. Is, they do. They repeat this number over and over and over. It's kind of like the 40 beheaded babies. Remember that? Remember that? They're still saying that. They're literally still saying 40 be That's not true. That's an absolute lie. It's a total lie. 100% lie. But they keep saying it. And there are people that still believe this shit. Literally. Well, hey, man, stupid is as stupid does, as Forrest Gump said. Why do you think all these families behind that make the world wicked with all the wars and destruction? Is, it, is money the root of all e no. evil? Power. Power. It's the same reason why a pedophile uh, uh, rapes a child. It's not the sexual. If you study psychologically what it is, it's it's domination, control, uh, narcissistic behavior. Have you ever? I've known narcissists. Yeah, we've all got a lot of narcissism, and as I believe every human, some worse than others, of course. Well, you have to. I've studied it because uh, an ex-girlfriend. I told you two things scare me: uh, big waves and women, right? ex-girlfriend accused me of of, uh, of of that and so i was like no i'm not and she kept saying it this was at the end of the breakup even now she 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 knows that's not the case but when you break up man if they really love you hey it's fantastic it's great boy when when you're a guy like me and you don't put her number one i'm taking risks i'm doing this i'm doing that then they don't like you no more. Oh boy, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Boy, she'll do everything to just <laughs> drive you down. They don't give a shit about you. They can take you, leave you. But if they really love you, it gets way more intense. So anyway, narcissists, um, the actual truth of them, although it would seem the obvious, I love Carly Simon. You're so vain. You probably think this song is about you. You walked into the room with one eye on the mirror. And it, <laughs> fucking brilliant. Anyway, um, Narcissists actually, uh, they have an inner hatred of themselves. They hate themselves. There's, there's some trauma or something within them that, that, that hates them, but it manifests in the opposite way. It, it, on the outside, it looks like they think they're like, I'm the greatest, man. I'm the best thing since sliced bread, man. I'm the shit. But in truth, they hate themselves. So that's why they're so destructive. Anybody who, again, would study psychology or understands the basics of love, like there's romantic love and then there's, there's, there's true love, like the mother's love for the child, a true mother. That is pure love. That is unconditional love. Um, if you don't love yourself, not in a narcissist, not in a fake egotistical way, a healthy way, We've all made mistakes. A lot of people are never able to come to terms with those mistakes and they feel an inner loathing or even an inner hatred of themselves. And while they can manifest some seemingly loving ideas or thoughts towards others, if you don't have a healthy love for yourself, you're not capable of fully loving anybody else. This is what makes narcissists so dangerous. They have a hatred for themselves and they are destructive to those around them. And they literally, they, if you got a narcissist in your life, you need to get out, get out. Like I'm not for breaking up marriages, but if you have a narcissist, like a true narc, you need to get out. They will destroy you and your kids. Who do you think controls the world? Yeah, and, and this is where it's, it's again, the secular, like this is where we get into the, the social engineering. The secularization, right? So if we look at the process, it's fairly explainable. With, with, say, for instance, the Catholic Church, there are popes that were actually honorable popes. That the, the pope has not always been some pedophile kid toucher, you know, covering up uh, cardinals raping choir boys. But in the, in the modern era, um, they've been infiltrated. It's the same thing, you know. It's been infiltrated and perverted from within. I know for me, like some of the more powerful things I've been able to do have been then destroyed from infiltration, from people getting on the inside, subverting my authority or my ability to communicate and so on and so forth. The enemy inside the gate is far more dangerous than a standing army on your border. Um, so um, who runs the world? It is, it's, it's it, the tool, 
that is used to run the world is money. That's the, the physical tool. So who controls the money? This is not realistically debatable. Who is in control of the money? If you look at usury, both in Islam and Christianity, this is not acceptable, literally. How many Christians even know this? How, how many Muslim, more Muslims know this? But how many of our nations are usury free? None, none. All of them operate on usury. And how are our economies doing? How are we doing? We doing good? Shit. We're doing shit, right? So usury and money is the vehicle. It's the vehicle. But you have a multi-pronged attack on the spiritual level. What they've done is infiltrated the churches, corrupted religion, so as to drive people away from God and towards secular so you may be agnostic or like Ricky Gervais. I love him. The guy's great. What he did at the Golden Globes, calling out yeah. DiCaprio, DiCaprio, and a whole lot of them was oh, absolutely nice. brilliant. But atheism is, man, like really like rejecting God altogether. For me, at the very least, I don't understand how an atheist can deny the fact that, listen, this shit started somewhere. There is a beginning point. There has to be a beginning if even if it's been here the whole time, it had to start somewhere. You know, there has to be a beginning point. But because we become secularized, like if we walk down the street today and say God, I say God bless you to everybody. I do, and and because of the way I am, people accept it. But if if you were a normal person, say Oh fuck you, what like, God? Yeah, pfft, whatever. A lot of people would mock you or laugh in this country for sure. America, it's largely the same, but you do have areas where we, we have fake Christianity. It's called Christian Zionism. So they took the Bible, the actual Bible, that the Aramaic Bible that Mel Gibson rightfully used for the Passion of the Christ. They've turned that into what's known as the Schofield Bible, General Schofield. He was a first-class pervert, piece of shit con man. This is a fact. I'm not making this up. So the Christian Zionists that you know about, you've heard of them, right? Mm -hmm. They're numbering the million, tens of millions in America. They're a formidable block of power. Their Bible is the Schofield Bible. In that Bible, which has been completely and totally twisted and perverted and turned upside down, that's why they believe that we must bend over, take it up the, you know, where the sun don't shine, and basically suck the, you know what, of the Jewish state of Israel because God commands us to do everything and and literally this is why they all go to israel and they get like these beautiful vip tours they never go to the west bank they meet all these israelis and aren't they all lovely and they have a good time and they come back these dumbasses are are, are going from a bible that is the end they're going they're all going to hell man like <laughs> you guys have rejected god and sided with the enemy anyway the point is they've rubbished religion so bad so you've got the money on the material side and you've got the corruption of the of the churches and religion on the spiritual side. So you've detached people from source, you've seduced them with the desire for money, and this is a very weakened state. You can control a population like that. Meanwhile, on their side, they also have a spiritual practice. They do. Their God is Satan. Lucifer, Satan, Gog, Magog. They worship Satan. And what does Satan want? I liken Satan to the worst kind of spoilt brat that you see in Walmart with fat parents. You know, like the, the kid that is screaming bloody fucking murder because he didn't get the popsicle or the peanut butter cups or whatever the fuck it was. This kid that is a screaming tantrum and really just commanding everybody's attention and and whatnot because of like this little brat satan i liken to that but satan is also incredibly powerful for those that reject god and all this stuff fine whatever satan is is what they call the jinn uh he actually can manifest in in physical material form i'd like to fight satan in the octagon by the way fuck it man i'd like to please let me just i, I don't care man i want to get one lick in with that son of a bitch but anyway um, Satan requires of his devotees the same kind of homage in his way 
that God would of us. So God, I don't believe God cares so much about your prayers. What he cares about is what you do. This is how you'll be judged. So for instance, right now, for all those people walking around, what did you do, mom, daddy, when this genocide was happening? This is going to be asked. God will also ask. God will know. This deity that they worship, Satan, Gog, Magog, requires the defilement of everything that God created. Literally. So God gave us, look look what he gave us. I mean, when we look at nature, are we not all at least... It's beautiful. We, we, we're all like... Yeah, Scotland's beautiful. Scotland is, is amazing. America is, is yeah. amazing. Bali is amazing. I love America. I love New York. And um, I was in Arizona. So many different places. And I love the Americans. Yeah. Because they're, they're fucking patriotic and they, they do love their country. Yeah. And if it was a war, they're the first to grab a rifle. Look, they are crazy. But I love the New York. I love the vibe. The people, just the food, the fast pace. Yeah. And the thing about the Americans... I feel as if I get helped more in America than I do in the UK. Yeah. People in the UK want to see you well. They just don't want to see you do better than them. You know, Morrissey the Smiths, we hate it when our friends become successful. Mm -hmm. Great song. Yeah, the world has manipulation, but if you can just see it a bit better, and if you don't see the good, become the good. And you've been very outspoken about 9-11, saying it's an inside job. Mm -hmm. Is that the same patterns through time as well, where they create these catastrophes to then give the green light to go and kill innocent people? Literally, yeah. And, and you know, that, that's, that begs another little chapter of my life quickly, is that um, just quickly on the whole Satan. Satan requires, uh, at the highest level, Satan wants uh, sacrifice of, of children. And in particular, there's plenty of evidence to show this. The most prized is Christian babies. Christian baby boys, even Madeline McCann, she was sold by her parents into Podesta, all this, all intertwines. Anyway, getting back to 9-11, I, in my former life, so I came out of the Marines, I was trying to figure out what am I going to do, I looked at business, I looked at this, I had a girlfriend, she got me a scuba certification in San Diego. And I made friends with the uh, instructor who taught me to scuba dive. And, you know, he told me about how he became an instructor and blah, blah, blah. And I realized, like, hey, that's an option. And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, let me do that. So I decided to become a, a scuba diving instructor. And, uh, and I had a, a girlfriend uh, who ended up being with me for several years who was Irish, uh, also my second cousin. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we ended up moving. She came out from London to uh, first California, and then we moved to Hawaii, where I became a dive instructor. In that time, I got all these tattoos. My, my reasoning for these tattoos was, you're not going to confuse me with your average white boy. No. Nah, so there you go. I, and by the way, 30 years ago, this shit, 30 years, I looked like a proper drug dealer convict back then, boy. Now it got all damn popular. Everybody's got a freaking tattoo, you know? It's almost like, shit, now I'm, let me take them off now. <laughs> like, no, I like my tattoos. But anyway, the bottom line is I was I separated myself. And, and every single job that I'd ever applied for before I got these tattoos, I can honestly say every single job I got it. I've always had a silver tongue. I'm a hard worker. I always got the job. After I got these tattoos, which I also knew this was going to happen, I knew it would force me to create my own path. So I became a dive instructor. I went to try to get a job. Nobody would hire me. They didn't want to hire me. In that industry, in that scuba diving industry, which we're talking generally well-to-do people on holiday in Hawaii or wherever they are, right? They don't want to see fucking the drug dealer convict kick guy. You know, they don't, they don't want to see me, so nobody would hire me. So I forced me to make, I, I created my own dive business. And I had this dive business. I built it from the ground up. My mom ended up coming in and being my partner because I couldn't handle all the business. She took an early retirement. That business, DP Ecology, there's videos uh, of, of this. I, I saved uh, 46 green sea turtles I pulled out of the water myself in the space of just over two years that were wrapped in fishing line. I saved their lives. 13 had to have their fins amputated because it was too late, but we were able to amputate it in a controlled environment. They did that, and then we were released it a month later after being re rehabilitated, and I saw several of those turtles, you know, months or even a year later, 
so they were still living. So, I mean, I was incredibly blessed, saving turtles. I was doing ghost net recoveries, which is nets that have been left abandoned, and they sit down there and they just keep killing. I did a couple of those at 200 feet deep. I was a technical diver. I was a cave diver. I could mix gases. I had the best dive shop and, and uh, fill station in the entire state of Hawaii, and my business ended up being raided the number one dive operation in the entire state of Hawaii, even though the diving on my island was the worst. You know, I was on Oahu, which is the main island. Uh, Maui, Kauai, the big island, all better diving, Lanai. In that time, I'm living on the beach, Coral Sand Beach. Once again, I'm living on the beach. I'm driving an Acura Legend, a really nice car. Um, I have two boats. I'm doing what I love. I'm making money. I'm getting international attention. BBC did a story about me. Animal Planet did a story about me. French media. I did over 100 local news stories of me rescuing turtles on video. And I was in my house and I happened to have an Iranian dude. I've always needed people who were fucking intelligent. The Yanks are too stupid. So I met this Iranian guy and I said, hey, go on, you can come live with me for a while. And he's like, so we were there and we got this phone call on 9-11. Hawaii's behind, right? So it was like three in the morning or something. We get this call like, turn on the news, turn on the news. And so I turn on the news and there we are. We're watching 9-11. And me and him looked at each other. I mean, I was I started off like, this is not what we're being told. And I knew this was like World War Three, or it was going to be like fucking huge. The beginning of the war on terror, weapons of mass destruction, Iraq, what they have to do with this, sorry. Uh was about to happen. I had everything. I had a life that anybody would kill for. But I was already confronting the cops on the constitutional levels of the tickets and things. So that's a whole another story. But I literally have court transcripts of me saying, what form of law are you practicing here? And calling out the judge and saying he's committing treason for not honoring his oath. And so I literally have that. So I've been fighting this since my 20s. On 9-11, when that happened, when I was watching it, I realized, like, fuck me, man. I have to get out of Dodge. And I told my mom within a day or two, I said, Mom, I, I can't stay here. I knew I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I knew it was some sort of false flag. And I was right. And within a year, I was on CNN live. There's footage. You can watch my CNN interview. I said live on CNN because it was live. On the hard talk interview that I did in 2003, I didn't say it because that's recorded like this. But on a live interview, now I can say it. I said that the United States government was either directly involved or complicit with 9-11. I don't know of anybody who said that. At that, Nobody. Nobody. If you can find anybody who said it on international news media before me, I'll be shocked. I've never seen it. I'm the first guy. So I was calling out 9-11. I left my paradise life and I sought political asylum in Holland and I lived in a refugee camp with a bunch of Africans in a place called Stadskanal. They got me as far away from Amsterdam and Den Haag and shit. They... <laughs> Yes, and way the fuck up there. <laughs> and I proved that I was a legitimate asylum seeker. I was the only asylum seeker from America in Europe. I proved. And they tried to get me out, but I proved it with a court transcript showing that they had issued an $11,000 bench warrant for my arrest um, for a minor traffic violation, of which I showed that I was in the court, but the judge acted like I wasn't in the court. I had the transcript to prove it. Explain that. And $11,000 back then? In 2001, an $11,000 bench warrant, you'd give that for somebody who was charged with like armed burglary who didn't appear in court. That's like, you don't give an $11,000 bench warrant for somebody who's accused of going 10 miles over the speed limit. <laughs> but they did for yeah. me. A lot of Americans still think it was a terror attack. But if you look at one of the women was given an interview and says the towers have fallen, the towers were still... Yeah, building seven. Built. Yeah. They were still there. And... Um, the jet fuel can't burn the, the beams and then it looks like it was detonated and then apparently everything was destroyed but the passports of the hijackers was... I'm an expert. I can I can lay this out. Yeah, in, let's go. In, in like, this is absolute truth. It, like, like you said at the beginning, you need to get to the source. You need to get to the root. That's when you, First off, whenever you do a homicide investigation or any investigator, who stands to gain is the first question. It's always the first question. So we have to go before 9-11 back to what was known as the Project for a New American Century or the neocons. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Remember the neocons? Neocon is a euphemism for Jews, basically. Zionist Jews. They're all Wolfowitz and all of them. They're, they're like all Jews except for one. 
They had a token Arab in there. Um, the Project for a New American Century wrote a paper in 2000, so this Jewish paper, called Rebuilding America's Defenses. In that document, it said that with the fall of the Soviet Union, basically 10 years earlier, with the fall of the Soviet Union, that the world had changed and that the two superpowers were now one. That the one superpower, America, needed to take advantage of this and become the world police. Like, you know, the, 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 the cop of the world, the, the ruler of the world, right? Because we're the good guys, right? This is the way they, they were, right? We're the good guys, obviously. You know, we beat communism now. We're the good guys. We need to take control. And this is rebuilding America's defenses. And they said, in order to do that, we would have to fight wars of aggression to secure the most important energy and resource reserves of the world. And that would allow us to control through the control of the resources like oil and minerals, Afghanistan and all these rich areas of deposits. We would then be able to achieve this goal of global spectrum dominance. In order to achieve this, we would have to fight these wars of aggression. There would be a lot of casualties and the American people did not have the stomach for that. And in this document, very famously, oh, for those of us who actually study history, they said the American people would never accept such an agenda. What was be needed in order to affect this policy of global spectrum dominance would be a, quote, new Pearl Harbor type event. This is their exact word. So that's 2000, right? So here's what we want to do. We want to go take over the entire world based on the fall of the Soviet Union, secure all the minerals in Afghanistan, the oil in Iraq, and all the other key reserves. We got Saudi Arabia. Gold, poppy fields. Poppy, all of it, right? All of it. And, but the American people are too stupid to realize this real great thing that we should be doing to like be the world police. And so they won't accept it, but a new Pearl Harbor could help uh, make that happen. So that's a year before 9-11. Let's look at 9-11. Before, before 2000, 1993. So those towers were built with asbestos. Have you heard of asbestos? Mm -hmm. I think everybody's heard of asbestos, right? Asbestos, if it's, you know what? If this building had asbestos in it, you know what would have to happen? You'd all be, you'd have to get out. You wouldn't be able to be. They can't build buildings with asbestos, right? Well, by the 90s, it became clear that the asbestos in the trade towers, the twin towers, was killing people because they were getting cancers. Of course, all the businesses and the moneyed interest in those buildings did their best to hide it as they do. But eventually, uh, some suits had come through and it became clear that the precedent had been set. These buildings had asbestos. The asbestos was getting into the lungs of people. They were developing cancers directly related to the asbestos in the buildings. That was a known fact. Now, the Port Authority of New York, which is Jew-controlled. <laughs> Manhattan is controlled by the Jews. I'm sorry. They, all the big real estate, pretty much. Oh, yeah, that's anti semitic Oh, it's true, though. Wait. Are you allowed to say true anti semitic Oh, for fuck's sake. So the Port Authority, who owned the Twin Towers wanted to get out from it they wanted to sell it but nobody would buy it so they tried to release their lawful ownership of it and they had gone through a 10-year period of lawsuits or a, a suit a case a legal case to get out from having the liability of these buildings right they tried to farm it off they couldn't do it and they lost the final case, like where they're liable now. So now the cost to remove the asbestos from the Twin Towers was in the billions, literally. So these buildings were actually already half empty come 2000, 
2001. There were already Bear Stearns, I think, or I forget, and one of those, they had already moved out because one a case had come through and, and like it was the precedent. Like, like all the companies that are leasing in that building are now going to be sued from anyone who gets any cancer, which is going to happen because there's a lot of long-term employees in there. So the buildings, again, everything I'm saying here, I can back up. I will destroy anybody who wants to debate me on this. I'll make them look stupid. I know this subject. I made a documentary about it. It's seriously shadow banned and censored, you know, but it's, I have it. Anyway, these buildings were worthless. The, the cost of removing the asbestos was worth far more than the actual buildings themselves. The Port Authority had lost its longstanding attempt to get out from under the buildings. And we now reach 2001, July, and lo and behold, two Jewish billionaires buy these buildings. Most don't know, I don't know any of this. Frank Lowy, Lucky Larry Silverstein. Two Jewish billionaires. So these are Jewish billionaires. Usually businessmen are kind of savvy about things. Usually, um, if you're looking at a business deal where the Port Authority is trying to get rid of buildings that are full of asbestos because the liability that they would incur from trying to remove that stuff is in the billions, and they haven't been able to get rid of it, they've tried a lawsuit, they've tried a suit to get out, they can't do it, and now that these buildings are true, truly nothing but billions of debt and liability, two Jewish billionaires, Frank Lowy and Larry Silverstein, connected directly to Mossad. What is the motto of Mossad? By way of deception, thou shalt do war. These two Jewish billionaires connected directly to the power structure within Israel and Mossad take control of the buildings. Guess what that means? Mossad had full access to the buildings for two months previous to 9-11, 2001. Because they just bought the buildings. Now, in that time that they bought the buildings, they doubled the insurance on the buildings. They increased the insurance. So they increased their policy on these worthless buildings. Okay, that's interesting. So these two Jewish billionaires just transferred billions of liability into their hands and increased the insurance. On the day, this is fairly well known, but again, people who don't know and don't care about truth and happy fucking go along with their, whatever they're doing in their lives. This, there's put options uh, that went that were predicting the fall of American Airlines stock that we know are connected to the CIA. Uh, and we saw on that day, everybody was betting on the stock going down. Kind of worked out well there because when the buildings got hit by planes, the stock of the airline companies went down and so they made a killing. Larry Silverstein and Frank Lowy, the two Jewish billionaires who had control of these buildings, which meant the whole control of the security of the buildings was in the Jewish billionaires' hands. Uh, Mossad, we have actual video proof evidence uh, that shows Mossad operatives in the buildings with blasting caps. So they were actually planting some explosives in the buildings, but that's not how they brought the buildings down. This is all fact. On 9-11, we saw two aluminum cans uh, run into these steel frame buildings with girders that wouldn't even budge from that aluminum can known as a plane. Um, and, and there's so many other things to throw us into smoke and mirrors. But the bottom line is, there's the, if we just accept planes, there's a lot of stuff to show that it's holograms. But that just makes it harder. To, let's just accept that they're fucking planes, all right? So these planes, these aluminum cans, hit buildings that are steel framed. And uh, we see the buildings on fire. All right, first first building gets hit, and then the second one. Now, I'm up, too, in Hawaii. We were all watching this, were we not? <laughs> we were all watching this, like the moon landing that didn't happen. Um, in fact, when I was being born, they were watching it. In the, I swear to God, I, my mom was in labor 17 hours. They were watching the fake moon landing while I was being born in the fucking delivery room. So anyway, on 9-11, these buildings get hit, and and then we saw we saw the buildings come down. We saw all the buildings come down. Now, 
first off, I know Richard Gage, uh, the head of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. I also was friends with a dear, lovely man, the chief fire investigator, Rudy Dent, who lost 444 of his brothers. Um, I know both of these men. I had a beautiful, I have a beautiful relationship with uh, Richard Gage, architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. They all came out and said there was no way that uh, an aluminum can with jet fuel is going to burn uh, the support beams and bring those buildings down. That is not engineering possible at all, period. Um, Rudy Dent, the chief fire investigator who reported on famously, he paid as well. He died from all the smoke that they inhaled. That's toxic asbestos and all sorts of shit they inhaled. He, he said clearly, I heard the explosions in the buildings. Um, and he and they he talked he exposed building seven as well like you know <laughs> that fucking thing that was a conventional demolition that one that one clearly that one was but if we look at the 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 falling of the twin towers they turned to dust they literally turned to dust now that technology which was little known then slightly more known now is called directed energy in fact when i was in maui recently they used directed energy to create fires with such intensity that we saw the engine blocks and rims of, of cars melted. A wildfire does not do that. Absolutely not. But you know what can melt steel? Directed energy. So these buildings that two Jewish billionaires that were full of asbestos that would have, if you brought it down with conventional demolition, you would have had to remove all of the asbestos, which would have cost billions. Well, it worked out quite well for Frank Lowy and Larry Silverstein. By the way, Larry Silverstein used to eat every single morning, every single workday. He went on the windows of the world, the North Tower, every day, except for that day. Apparently he had his, uh, uh, an optometrist appointment that day. He missed that day. Do you know that Jews who worked in the building received a text message saying not to go to work? No Jews died there. In fact, oh, it's anti-Semitic. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, they did. Odigo gave him, gave him a text message saying, don't, you're calling sick. <laughs> Lucky Larry had an optometrist appointment, so he wasn't there either. But a bunch of goy died that day. I also know Rich uh, Rodriguez, who was the man who had the key that saved a bunch of people's lives. Uh, he was He's a friend of mine too. But bottom line is this, those worthless asbestos-laden buildings that were a liability to the tune of billions that were now purchased by Jewish billionaires Slowey and Silverstein with doubled insurance policies, now fell to dust. Oh, that's disposable, disposal problem done. Free too, apparently. So you don't have to dispose of nothing. Now your buildings are gone. They've turned to dust, no less. All based on what? Tin, can I'm sorry, planes hitting fucking steel and a fire and they fall into their own footprint. And do you know, again, people don't know this. They say they carted away all the steel to China. Bullshit. They were gone. There were holes in the ground with molten steel. This is what Rudy Dent said. This is what the firemen said. They all said this. Again, none of this is explained by a conventional demolition. They did set off some charges. We see the squibs coming out. They did. But that's all diversion. That's just to get us all fighting. Oh, it was this, it was this. Who did it? Is it debatable whether two Jewish billionaires bought these worthless asbestos-laden buildings that transferred billions in debt to them or liability to them? That's not debatable. That is not debatable. That's not a very good business decision, but boy, they did get real lucky, didn't they? And guess who they blamed it on? Who'd they blame 9-11? 19 dudes with fucking box cutters? Who hijacked planes that brought down two buildings? Brought down three buildings with two planes. They say debris from one of the towers hit a corner of the building seven, and that that's what brought it down into its own footprint. This is a fucking joke. Nobody with any kind of critical thinking would buy this. And it's proof positive. I've said this is the litmus test. Not only that it's an inside job, you idiots, but that it was an inside job based on the very, very well-declared principle of by way of deception thou shalt do war, Mossad. Who makes money from war? I said it earlier. The bankers. Who are the bankers? Jews. Who is Mossad? Jews. 
Who's fucking exterminating my people in Gaza right now? The Jewish state of Israel. Who considers us to be Goyim, the Jews? And the good ones, God bless them. Ilian Pape, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. God bless you, Ilian. Stanley Kubrick, a Jew. I love him. <laughs> I do. And the Jews who fought for Adolf Hitler, the 150,000 Jews that fought faithfully, including in the SS. God bless you. Gilad Atzman, a friend of mine, a, a saxophonist, world class, who, who lived here and got run out of this town because he also knows about his own people. This group of people runs the world. They carried out 9-11. They blamed it on Muslims. Muslims had nothing to do with it. And then we went and invaded Iraq, which had nothing to do with it. Nothing. Nothing. But you know, there's something called the Greater Israel Project, and guess what target number one of the Greater Israel Project is? Iraq, which had nothing to do with 9-11. And there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq under Saddam, by the way. Now we got ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al... What? By way of deception, thou shalt do war? ISIS. What does that really stand for? Israeli Secret Intelligence Services. How many times has ISIS or Al-Qaeda attacked Israel? Zero. I'm sorry. Uh, this doesn't work for me. And you can take your fucking Holocaust six million gas chamber shit and shove it up your fucking ass. It's a lie. What do you think hit the towers? What do you think hit the towers? The twin towers? The twin towers? The, listen. Oh, some people say it was missiles or some people say it was uh, missiles with wings on it. Um, some people obviously say it's airplanes because then you've got the hijackers. Um, the Bin Laden videos. I know the Bin Ladens were flew out of America. I think they owned a big percentage or a small percentage of America. If I'm correct, like 6% or 8% Bin Laden's family. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah no, they were all flown out. And then uh, the only people arrested on the day... I forgot that. The only people arrested on the day were Israelis. The dancing Israelis. You ever hear of them? No. Yeah. So there was a woman. Everybody's watching, obviously. <laughs> you know, if you're living in, in proximity and you can see the Twin Towers, obviously you're watching. Like, <laughs> How are you not going to watch this? So one person, a lady, who's famously interviewed. They probably killed her. I don't know what happened to her. But either way, she, she called the police because she saw a group of men with binoculars filming and celebrating which didn't make sense you know like why would somebody so she called the police she thought this was suspicious these are what's known as the dancing israelis i believe there was four of them three or four and they later were they were arrested but they were then released and quietly deported but they weren't the only israelis arrested that day they then did an interview in Tel Aviv. It's on. People can go look, Google it. I'll turn, it's still there. And they said on live television in Tel Aviv, Israel, that they were sent to film the event. That's what they were. And that they are Mossad. They pose as like art students. This is part of their MO. So they're art students. They're actually Mossad. They infiltrate. So anyway... They said on record, this is not my opinion, this is what they said. They were, they were, they had foreknowledge and they were sent there to film the event, and that's why they were celebrating. Okay, so that's one of them. There was also other Israelis that were arrested. They were in a big truck that had been reported as suspicious. It was pulled over by the police. They inspected the vehicle, which was heading towards the George Washington Bridge, and Lo and behold, it was full of explosives. And guess who the driver and the occupants of that vehicle were? Israelis? Yes, they were Israelis. They were also arrested. They were questioned and they failed lie detector tests. But we had a Jewish uh, secretary of defense. Uh, oh my God, what's his name? Oh my God. It was a Jew in the executive branch who quietly deported the Israelis with explosives, the Israelis who were caught dancing, and failed lie detector tests. A Jew in our government sent them home, 
nice and quiet like. Fox News actually did a story, funny enough, Fox News. They did a really great story about this. And it only got told once and they shut it down. But that is out there. The only people, and it exposed not only these ones that were arrested, but the biggest spy ring in U.S. history, Israelis. This was on Fox. They had proof. Like, this wasn't their opinion. These are all facts. Is that anti-Semitic? Oh, yeah, the truth is anti-Semitic. The truth is truly anti-Semitic. You're not allowed to say these things. And only a crazy bastard like me will say these types of things. But it's true. And as I said earlier, truth is God and God is truth. What about Bin Laden? who was doing the videos in a so-called cave. Obviously, we've seen people now with the orange jumpsuits pretending to be beheaded. We've got the green screen as if they're in the desert and it causes chaos and fear. But what about the Bin Laden thing um, with the videos and he was involved and yeah. what was that? How was that? What's the truth behind that? It's um, the same thing as the, uh, the, uh, the, the 19 hijackers. They're CIA assets and they get paid they in this case remember uh oswald the one who supposedly killed kennedy what did he say before he got shot by a jew <laughs> in the gut and didn't get to testify <laughs> i'm a patsy he said he was a patsy he was a patsy there's no way from the angle i mean anybody who does any analysis of the assassination of jfk there's no way that oswald could have done that no way Absolutely not. There's multiple shots anyway. So anyway, um, these idiots, they get paid by the CIA to like fly here, fly there, stay here. Mohammed Atta, the chief, uh, you know, uh, hijacker, Mohammed Atta, was hanging out in Florida at a flight school where even the flight school instructor said those guys couldn't even fly a Cessna. Literally. Was going out with a stripper and snorting cocaine. Does that sound like somebody who's on a jihad? No, it sounds like a fucking patsy, a idiot who works for the CIA, who gets money to go snort coke, have sex with strippers, and be on this plane at this time and go over here and stay in that hotel and leave your passport here. <laughs> <laughs> it is ridiculous, man. It is absolutely ridiculous. And it just shows, like, uh, how fucking stupid are we seriously going to get? I mean, this this has been happening over and over. So, you know, the, 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 the planes, look, the Pentagon, I know enough about that, too. All of the tapes surrounding the Pentagon, <laughs> they were all taken away and apparently and they even acknowledge in the official bullshit 9-11 commission report which is just beyond a, a fucking snow job it's ridiculous um oh the the tapes were lost <laughs> right and that hole that that plane was supposed to <laughs> you are truly having a laugh mate you're having a laugh mate surely right that's a good one mate i like that one there was no fucking plane there. <clears throat> that was a missile for sure. Um, if we're going to get into what hit the buildings, nothing hit the third building. <laughs> that was clearly a controlled demolition. Again, Rudy Dent, chief fire investigator on the day, he heard all of the explosions, as did many others. That's not debatable. It's been thoroughly reported, although not repeated. And people to this day, including all the politicians, I don't know any politician who would suggest that anything other than these 19 hijackers, chief among them, Atis, Norton Coke, fucking strippers, uh, were on a jihad and overpowered the entire might of the military uh, industrial complex and took out three buildings with two planes uh, with box cutters and uh, their passports conveniently. Oh my God, dude, you are having a laugh. It's two Jewish billionaires with Mossad that blamed it on Muslims so that we could carry out the global spectrum dominance agenda laid out by the Project for a New American Century. And it's all there. How do you think the Americans would react if they had all this information, that innocent people were jumping up the building and dying all through this and then invading other countries because you think it's the right thing to do, because your country's in threat? How do you think the Americans would stand if they knew? There's a man named Alan Sobrowski. Uh, he is 
a professor at the Army War College at uh, West Point. He is top level, security level um, uh, U.S. military. Um, his credentials are undeniable. Um, you can look online and you could find Alan Sobrowski. Um, God bless you, Alan. Uh, he, he literally has said on record 100% what I'm saying. Israel did this and he's talked to like Pentagon officials and, and like, if you want to destroy your political career, then you will open your mouth about this. If you want to destroy your political career, then you'll say the word genocide, even though it's bloody obvious. If you want to destroy, uh, your access to money, then, you know, you, you go ahead and speak like I'm speaking right now. Um, <clears throat> Alan Sobrowski said, when the American people, to answer your question, when they find out, they're going to they're gonna be coming for, for the Jews' blood. They're going to fucking destroy Israel. Question is, are they ever going to figure it out? And, and we are closer now. See, and I'm the guy who's not even calling for that. I, I'm not, like, I, I want lawful prosecutions. If you committed war crimes and genocide and, and treason, that's a hangable offense right there. That's enough for me. I don't need no extrajudicial kill. I don't, I'm not going to lower myself to the level of, of, of my enemy. Because then who's different? Listen, if somebody's raping my child or whatever, you know, like, obviously, you know, there's situations that we can get into that, that would really not be good. But I'm, I've stood for law, and that's why the law the police of this country have gotten an order from their masters. How many people in this country understand common law? <laughs> I know more about British law than British people do. There's a bill of rights in this country, something called Magna Carta. That's the law. That's the actual law. Acts of parliament are not law. They're not, they're not lawmakers. You have laws. They exist. Common law, no injury, no crime, which allows freedom, see. If you don't hurt nobody, you haven't committed no crime. But how many laws are on the books on the acts of... Ridiculous. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Ridiculous amount. Actually, no. There is law. We need law. If you take away the law, what we have is impunity. You see, even now, it took all this really, like, open declarations of genocide by the Jewish state of Israel. I mean... They're, we're dealing with human animals. We'll treat them as such. Um, they've destroyed all the hospitals. They've destroyed all the schools. They've destroyed all the historic sites, including the oldest Christian church in the world, in Gaza, with Christians in it. Um, they've openly declared over and over, and their population openly acknowledges and wants to exterminate the Palestinians who happen to be the descendants of Jesus. How could a little country like this, with 0.2% of the human population, that's the Jewish population of the world, 0.2%, 2% in the United States, in this country it's, it's similar. How does this tiny fraction of people have this extraordinary power? How? How is that possible? Money. What is going on with Palestine? Obviously, we're talking nearly 40,000 people, innocent children, women dying. And Israel, why has it been going on for, for so long between um, Israel and Palestine? What is the true meaning behind it? And why is it still going on to this day, obviously? And people will still talk about Hamas as well as being bad, especially with the um, last year at the kind of festival. And there's people just arguing, fighting, and you get Ukraine and Russia as well. But the Palestine and Israel thing, what is the true source behind it? Why is it still going on to this day? Okay, so back in the 1800s, uh, Theodore Herzl, the father of Zionism, um, worked with Karl Marx, who's the father of communism. That's not his real name. His real name is Moses Mordecai Levy, who's descended from a long line of Talmudic Jews. I'm not making this up. Uh, they worked with financiers. Uh, they created Zionism. They created Bolshevism. They created communism. And they laid out a plan to, uh, to take over the Holy Land. Now, the Rothschilds started buying Jerusalem 
in the early 1800s. Again, this is not my opinion. This is fact. Verifiable fact for those that care about truth and want to know history. So, the Rothschilds, as early as the early 1800s, started using their usury banking money to buy Jerusalem. In, this, in synchronicity with that, you had Theodore Herzl, Moses Mordecai Levy, and other prominent Jews being financed by Rothschilds and Rockefeller elites in New York that were sending money. None of these people had any connection to this land. And they used this trope of them returning in a biblical fashion to the land. The real intention is not just for what we see as Israel. The real intention is for what's known as greater Israel. Greater Israel encompasses all of the land from the river Euphrates all the way down to the river Nile in Egypt. So we're talking parts of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt from the river Euphrates up in the north to the river Nile in the south, going inland all the way into Saudi and whatnot, coming across directly. That's greater Israel. The next empire to inherit this mantle, which America sort of, at least uh, as most people recognize it, it was the British Empire, it became America. I would argue that's not true. The actual power is here in London. The city of London is the seat of power. But America became the muscle. Before that, England was both the money and the muscle. It did, from its naval power. That's, that's how England was able to do it. But in the nuclear age, post-World War II, America became the power, the muscle. But if you're telling me that, that Washington, D.C. is made, no, they're not. No, they're not. No, they're not. They got their piece of the pie. They get to go ahead and spread the spoils. But it's power is right here. I guess that's why God has me here still, because I would, I would be in Malaysia. And if I'm going to be here, then I'm going to talk as I am. So, you know, where we find ourselves now is, is we're at the, the pivotal point in history. This really is it. And we are on the verge. This, this poking the bear, the Russian bear over there, this is a ridiculously dangerous game. They're not pussies, man. They, they, they're, you know, their military, by the way, <laughs> blows away the American military. The Iranians, I was just in Iran a year and a half ago. Uh, I've been there four or five, five times, I think. They gave me a tour of their, uh, of their like security, top security clearance uh, facilities where I, I got access. I have pictures of me and everything and like in the facility. Um, their missile technology is, is uh, supersonic. It, it, it is, it, it, their, the Iron Dome is basically destroyed. The amount of money that it's cost um, with Katusha rockets being fired from Lebanon that have set off these Iron Dome defenses, which is like 20 million a pop. Um, the defenses of Israel are down. Um, America is its only remaining uh, benefactor that, that can, if, if obviously if Israel did not have the weapons coming from my birth nation, that's it. Game, set, match. It's over. Um, America is now imploding. We see Saudi Arabia is now officially no longer trading on the dollar. It, it, it has, some will be traded in the dollar, but it's already trading in outside of the dollar. That means the American dollar is going to tank hard. Inflation is already rampant. And the pound, which remains strong, is not going to remain as it has historically. Everybody in England could always count on the pound. It's always been either the strongest or one of the strongest currencies in the world. I remember the days when, you know, $3 to a pound and, you know, like $2 to a pound. Now it's the same, basically yeah. the same. One pound for a dollar. Used yeah. To be, I remember it was like 2.2. .2. Yep. Yep. For every grand, you were getting two thousand two hundred dollars. See, this is why comfort is the real enemy. See, everybody got real comfortable, you know, because like as much as like people who consider themselves poor in this country are rich by global standards. Does everybody work together? Like, even though 
I think a lot of people are under the same umbrella. We talk about the Rothschilds and the banking system. I think he mm. sent his sons out to corner the banking. And um, but what about the Russians? Who owns the Russians? Who owns China? Who's behind them? Yeah. Who's because I watched Putin's interview and he's basically saying that he tried to sign a peace agreement. America told Ukraine not to sign it. Yeah. He wanted peace and he's been telling NATO stop coming closer. They're creeping closer. Yeah. They're, like you say, it's poking the bear. This guy doesn't want war. Every, his male and female, they're thriving. They don't take any bullshit. The women are stunning. They look after themselves. They they're really healthy. Are, yeah. um, I don't know all the answers. I cannot, people must watch and listen. They must question you, everything you're saying, question everything I'm saying because we don't always get it right. But you've just got to question the motives. Like you say, who's behind it? Who financially gains from it? But who's behind Russia? In China, is there, is there other families behind them? Because the Rothschilds, they don't rule the world. They're like, they talk, you're talking about the Jews and having a big say in things, a very small percentage, but who's behind the Russians then in China? Is it different families? How does it all work and operate? Well, we, we do clearly see a massive, undeniable shift from west to east. And when we look, so, you know, there's a couple of things to that question. Um, one, we see the shift from west to east. There's no question to this. The Silk Road that runs from Istanbul or Constantinople, as it was known before, um, that runs into uh, the trade routes through Russia. Into uh, also, it can lead. It leads into Iran, over to China, and now they've combined uh, all of their tr shipping and trade routes. They've come together, and they're using the Arctic for a, a massive ability to really just send. So their economy is rock solid, even with all these sanctions that historically would crush countries. Iran has survived, although I've lived there, definitely been a very depressed economy. They've definitely paid, um, but they're coming back. Um, their military capacity destroys ours. Our, like our battleships and, and aircraft, those things are sitting ducks for these hypersonic missiles they got. <laughs> Those things will get taken out. Um, the Who runs? Well, okay. There, There is no question that Jewish power does not end at China or or Russia or or even Iran. The tentacles of Jewish power are, are still there. They, they still, they hold too many interests, but they don't run the show. They don't run the show and their power is waning and and we look at russia as i pointed out earlier nobody is building more churches and mosques now this is completely counter to to the agenda of the of the powers that be they do not want people becoming or going back to god and spirituality it is not in their interest at all so that should speak volumes if you have you, you've listened to vladimir putin speak right if you listen to him speak it can you imagine if we had a leader like that the guy is incredibly intelligent articulate very geopolitically savvy the guy is not stupid and they can fight i think he's like an eighth dan seventh dan i could if i'm, if I'm I might not, but that could be totally wrong, but I know he can fight. I know he's stood up. Yeah, no, he, and he's, laps. he is. No, he's a tough man and he's older, but dude, if you put Biden again, pfft, yeah, that would be a, a joke. We got stumbling Joe Biden. One thing I would say on this note of like how you take over a country and what happened to us and how we got this way. I, there's an absolutely brilliant, brilliant, brilliant interview from 1984 of a KGB defector named Yuri Brezhnev. Yuri who defected was he lived as you know under the communist system as a kgb agent and he was assigned to india and, and some other places and he talks about in this interview how that this notion of james bond that's like ridiculous like hollywood shit none of it works that way it's great for the movies and all it's entertaining but it has nothing to do with the way you take over a country espionage works very very simply and it's a four-step process um, and it takes 20 years. And the reason why it takes 20 years is one generation. So part of that process is uh, women's rights and equality. So the children, which used to be raised by the traditional family mother, which was her job, now the mother is working, so you get to tax the mother and the father, and the children go to the school, which is indoctrination. It's not really teaching them. <laughs> so... 
this is part of the breakdown of the family, right? And so you start there, and then you can control the kids, right? Within 20 years, you've, you've brainwashed them into a state of stupidity, whereby, like in America, you've got college students who couldn't tell you where, I don't know, where, where's Czechoslovakia? I mean, that would be really hard for them. Like, you know, they, they would have no clue. Like, where's, where's, where's Egypt? You know, like, they'd probably point to fucking South Pole or some shit. Um, so the, uh, the 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 system of, of of power over in that part of the world is now moving it, it we've got problems i mean it, it's it, but it, it is moving away from the dollar system and there are elements of non-usury that are entering into the equation we clearly see the BRICS nations now turkey wants to join BRICS. um all of this is happening the shift from west to east couldn't be more obvious and the implosion that is occurring is a socially engineered one based on the, the demoralization is the first step. You demoralize, it's forced to demoral, demoralize and then crisis, normalization. And uh, I can't believe I'm forgetting the fourth one. Yuri Brezhnev does not I've got to memorize that again. Bottom line is we've been demoralized. It, would you say it's fairly demoralizing to have a government where say R rishi sunak is your your your, your top guy yeah and but how does america go from one percent of being obese 30 years ago to then over 40 percent yeah how does that happen why would you not want your country thriving why is that is it is there more darkness to that or is people just getting softer you look at the old photos from the 60s and the 70s your generation you says the 70s people were lean people ate fresh meat people yeah. the wheat was clean everything yeah and your fries didn't even eat that much but you would just look good yeah and then for i think america is the sickest country on the planet yeah look how, who who is behind that who is wanting that demise of a country a strong country one of the strongest for many many years to then becoming the weakest, the same as the UK. The UK is on its ass. Yeah. Forty percent tax. It's raining every day now. People are sad. People are weak. Depression's on the rise. Dementia's on the rise. Dementia wasn't really even heard of in the sixties no. and seventies. Now it's the biggest killer. Yeah. They're talking about the waters being chemically sprayed and foods being sprayed and well five okay. G. Like how was I mean? Who who do you think's behind it all? COVID is a big one. I Lockdown never, showed me how fucking weak the world is. Yeah, I remember I, I never wore that fucking diaper on my face. I can honestly say that. And I traveled, I was homeless at the time. I was living in my van. So I drove all the way from Seattle when it started. I was in Seattle, right there in Bill Gatesville. And I drove all the way across the country. And I saw different levels of stupidity and complicity and submission to this bollocks. Um, Florida, ironically, was the most like open, you know, one. But then I got ripped off. The cops stole everything I had there. So anyway, that's another story. But um, COVID, let's that's a satanic agenda right there. What they've done is they've tinkered with DNA with this mRNA, and they did it based on a complete lie. It was always like whatever a weaponized cold or flu for sure. They they've tinkered with that, but. It didn't take, I actually got COVID. I actually had it myself. I don't know if you got it. Yeah, same. I did, and I was quite sick. I don't get sick. Like I don't get sick either, yeah. but it was a 99.9% .9 survival that kind of raised alarms for me. I'm thinking, well, yeah. nobody can really die from it. Yeah. But I know people say, oh, but somebody was getting knocked down with a bus, a bus, but because two weeks ago they had COVID, they were sending it off as it died with COVID. But look at the cardiac arrest now. Look yeah. at the, the turbo cancers. Look at... Yeah. Um, the immune the, systems the, of everybody. The, the, the proteins, it's yeah. the rise in proteins in the body. It's undeniable. Yeah. It's undeniable. And now they've come out, that little guy who was behind it all. Fauci. Fauci. And um, says that he made it all up. Yeah. Look, how can you go to a restaurant, wear a mask, but then you can sit down, take your mask off as if it just up, walks up and vanishes like it is? When you actually look back, and I'm glad I've done it because I was still climbing mountains, doing my cold water therapy. And people were saying, oh, you're killing my gran. I was basically saying, listen, fuck your gran. I'm looking after me. And it's not, I wasn't wanting it to die, obviously, but look after me. I'm, I'm up in a mountain, up in a way up in Scotland, not near anyone. How the fuck can I harm anybody? Yeah. I was, and I was getting fines because the police were fining you for driving certain <laughs> distances. And I'm thinking, fuck off. <laughs> um, because, but I was still unsure, if, I, if I'm honest as well, Ken, because I'm not a scientist or a doctor. And because people were drilled with so much fear, I did think, I actually thought about getting the vaccine. And then I thought, what the fuck am I thinking about? Because people were so 
on it and thinking, get it, you're saving lives. And it was everywhere, every newspaper, every doctor. The world is upside yeah, down, every, I'm and you think, you, man. am I in the wrong? Because you don't want to, I don't want to harm anybody. I want people to do good. But it does make you question. Here's the thing. I, this opens up a story of why I know not to believe the government. When I was in the military, this harkens back to Adolf again, too. I can do I've done this many times. When I was in the first Gulf War, uh, we went off to fight Saddam, and it was known that he had huge stockpiles of chemical, biological weapons. How did we know that? We supplied him. <laughs> Literally. We supplied him. He used them against the Kurds, and he also used them against the Iranians. I've met Iranians who are still respiratory and skin uh, legions problems from the chemical and biological weapons that we gave Saddam Hussein. So when we went to this war, they, my government, uh, provided us with drugs and injections to protect us against the chemical weapons that we might come into contact with. Now, there's a couple of points here to point out about these medicines they gave us. One, these were experimental, undeniably, indisputably experimental. Two, we were not asked to take these experimental drugs. We were ordered to take these drugs. Three, something called Gulf War Syndrome, which the government did everything to cover up is a fact many died and we see the rise in concert with these injections and pills that were experimental that we weren't asked uh, whether we wanted to take them or not and we were not informed about any possibility of some negative long-term consequences so let's get this straight our government while calling us heroes publicly orders us to take experimental drugs of which they know not the long-term effects. They don't ask us, they order us. And didn't they say that about Adolf Hitler? I think. Didn't they say he experimented on Jews? George Bush did that on me. And many died from Gulf War Syndrome, from the experimental drugs. I'm a human guinea pig, literally. 600,000 of us were human guinea pigs. The Brits were also human guinea pigs. Guess how many died of Gulf War Syndrome outside of British and American troops? Zero. Bit of a coincidence, that, isn't it? So I stopped trusting my government 30 plus years ago. I haven't had an injection since I was in the military. I don't go to doctors. I've often said, I trust Tyrone on the street corner selling me crack <laughs> more then I trust the dude with the white coat and PhD selling me some fucking prescription for Xanax or whatever the hell he's got. Literally. Do you know how many people die from drug overdoses for illegal drugs as compared to the legal ones? A tiny fraction. The vast majority are dying from the legal drug, I mean doctors. Literally. Who's behind the pharmaceutical industry? The Jews own it. If you look at all the major, Moderna and all of them. In fact, there's a thing... Uh, <laughs> Goyim Defense League, <laughs> they'll like the plug. Censored is all hell. Who owns the pharmaceutical industries? Overwhelmingly Jews. Who controls the cabinet uh, and the governments of, uh, of, of our nations? Overwhelmingly Jews. Who controls the banks? Indisputably the Jews. Um, who controls the weapons industries? BlackRock and Vanguard? Jews. Who owns the UFC for that matter? Jews. Dude, they own it all. They literally own it all. That's why it's career suicide to like, you know, <laughs> you have to be independent to even think, uh, to say this. And, you know, again, you have to be fearless. I, I, I'm going to die with my honor, period, end of story. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep praying to God and keep doing my best. Um, but they own it all. What do you think of the schooling system? Because I know Rock. I'm not saying like, there are some goy, just to be clear. It, it's not as if there's no non-Jew, like, rich people. Of course there are. But they're also largely what we call Sabbath goy. <laughs> they certainly work with the tribe. They're not going to be adversarial to the tribe. 
Mm-hmm. What about the schooling system? Because I know Rockefeller started that, I think, 1920s, maybe. Um, what do you think of the schooling system? And Western medicine. Mm-hmm. That's Rockefeller's. So their first product, I read a great book called Naked Empress, The Great Medical Fraud by Hans Rusch. For those watching, man, these books are epic. Epic. I learned so much from these books. This uh, Hans Rusch is a medical historian. Um, so it, it's purely an evidence-based historical analysis of like the origin of what we now know as Western medicine, which is allopathic. Um, so allopathic medicine effectively purports, uh, it, it, it's on the basis that it's these outside contagions that attack our organism and we have to fight these things off and have these things to defend us against them and it's it's that's the notion right um but previous to that natural hygiene and natural healing and these the nuts and herbs and seeds that god mentions in the bible which can heal us on all different types of levels that was what was used to be known but it's largely been lost but it really took root, the Western medical establishment as we see it today, which ties in directly to the education system of the Rockefellers. Um, that changed in the early 1900s, and it started with, uh, the, the Rockefellers are an oil family, so they had this uh, oil byproduct um, that was basically toxic shit, and you know, it, it was like the leftovers of of the oil that was sellable and usable and whatnot, right? What the Rockefellers did was they they packaged it and called it Nujol, N-U-J-O-I-L, right, oil at the end. And they sold it as a cure for herpes, a cure for venereal diseases, a cure for cancer, a cure for everything. All it was was toxic waste, but they made a mint because they had the ability to present it, and, you know, market it, and people bought it, and they literally started the poisoning of of the people in this fraud known as Western medicine, which is all about invasive surgeries, drugs, chemotherapy, things that cost an arm and a leg. People are bankrupting themselves getting these horrendous treatments. I don't go to doctors. I don't get sick for COVID. I was sick for a few days. I sweat like a banshee, and then it was over. Yeah, the um, immune system so strong. The immune system, if you, but again, the gut-brain connection is so powerful, but they're poisoning your foods and weakening your skies. You're going to become weak. Yeah. Just to try and educate yourself enough to just question everything. How can you make yourself stronger? How can you detox, parasite, cleanse? And there's so much you need to do, um, and it can be tiring towards the world, but you go back to the 1800s, we had electric cars then. Early yeah. 1900s, we had cars. Running on water, yeah, hydrogen. Guy, really. heart attack, died. Nikola Think Tesla had free energy for free us way elect- back when. Free electricity. Yeah. Like, the world is free, but yet we pay to live here. Yeah. We kill ourselves daily on jobs that we don't like to try and survive on a, a world see, that's isn't free. that the beautiful part of it, though, James, is that, honestly, like, as dark and as destitute and as hopeless as it seems, it's not really. We, we can we can and we must. We, we we have solutions to everything. I this I have world citizen man, world citizen. When I I I I have a plan. I, I literally have a plan: how to build, how to provide water, how to clean the air, how to provide real education, real history, real spirituality. You know, even boot camps for, for, for pubescent kids, like, you know, to, to trans, transform you from, from adolescent into man or woman. Um, we have solutions. They're there. They exist. The, the pessimist, is, that I've often said the pessimist is the tyrant's best friend. If you have a mate and they're pessimist and you are, like, optimistic or you're, you're like, trying to improve the world or do good things, they mean, oh, mate, come on, be real, man. you got to look. Mm. Fuck you, man. You know what? I'd rather be, I, I'm not delusional. I'm realistically optimistic. I'm realistically optimistic. Um, and And we can change this world. And I think that's why conversations like this, like, people can take from it whatever they want, but I know for a fact that the information that I'm sharing, I know what what is my intention with this? Is it to be the guy like, look at me, look how fucking, no, no. 
I want a better world, damn it. I really do. This is not something I can feel good about handing to my kids. Getting back to what I want in my dying moment, I want to be able to go and stand in front of a mirror, look myself in the mirror, and be able to say, well done. Fuck yeah. And feel good about handing this over to all of the kids. And like the Indians, who aren't fucking Indian, you assholes, they're the first Americans. You, you weren't, we, should, we should be thinking like them. Not that the, all the tribes are the same, but this is fairly uniform within them. If, if you do something, you have to do, you cannot do anything and think seven generations out. Like if you put plastic in the ground and then that causes some toxicity and it causes a problem two generations down the road. No, no, no. This is our planet, man. This is our mother. We are not only metaphorically, literally raping our mother the very planet that sustains us, we rape it. We allow the money and coveting the material to even prop up these assholes like Elon Musk and fuck you with your free speech, man. But hey, man, thanks for the platform so far. Um, these billionaires, w w is this the highest aspiration of humanity? What, to be some extravagant punk who can have a Lamborghini in London? Like, what... <laughs> What the hell is that? Are we not capable of something more than this? I tell you this, like, as an example in my life, like the joy that I've known, the happiness I feel, the freedom I understand, and, and just the, the way I sleep at night and everything, the blessed man that I am, one of the greatest moments of my life was when I sailed into Gaza as a captain in 2008. We were the first boats to sail into Gaza in 41 years. Nobody had made it. Nobody was allowed because the Jewish state wouldn't allow it, right, since 67. We sailed in. You know what happened? The Palestinians did not think we would make it. They really didn't. But when we did actually come into view and start slowly but surely getting towards the harbor, they flooded all of their fishing boats and all the vessels they had. People, kids, everything were jumping into the water and, and they were like waving, they were smiling. Do you know the joy that I felt and, and, and shared with the people who felt abandoned for the longest time? Would I feel better if I got myself a Lamborghini or, or bought myself a penthouse in Chelsea? No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade that for nothing. And all these rich people who have all these luxuries, I feel sorry for them in all honesty. Most of them, and I think you're shrewd enough and you've lived this town long enough to know, these rich people, are they as happy as, as they present themselves no, to be? No. No, they're not. I always say that. I interview billionaires, homeless men. Nobody's really got it figured out. I think that becomes the status, and the majority of billionaires are unhappy because everything they chase is limitless. So it's never ending. Yeah. Never, there's no true purpose um, because you can be good in the world and listen you can do what you want with your own money but why is there somebody sitting with 50 billion in the bank when there's people starving why is there somebody sitting with 50 million people in the bank when there's not clean water and like I say people can do what they want with their money but human human beings aren't actually good we're actually born good yes. it's just certain circumstances it creates us to then be damaged and try and hurt others moon landings why the big lie about it obviously people say the Americans wanted to beat the Russians and but why the big lie? Because I, I speak to people who say we're living in a, a glass dome. I speak to people who say the world's round, the world's flat. I'm not asked. My question is, but why the lie? They're hiding something. That's the way I see it. Because I've never seen all this with more eyes. I would love to go up to space. And even if there is space of the universe, um, because I've watched videos and I've spoken to people who try to send up cameras and it say it hits a roof. Um, like the Truman Show kind of thing. And I could be crazy. I think we're all fucking crazy. But the moon landings, if you actually look at and break it down and how fake it is and the machinery that they used, the camera's moving, the flag's moving, the boot's not even the same. Do you know who filmed it? Who? Stanley Kubrick. Remember, a great movie, which is timeless, came out in 1968, a year before the moon landing. 2001, A Space Odyssey. Now, if you go watch that movie... You'd be, no freaking way was that made in, two, in 1968. It looks like it could have been made in 2000. L uh, even later. 
I mean, only the haircuts would maybe give it away and stuff. But other than that, it's all in space and it all like is it's incredible. Stanley Kubrick, a Jew, who by the way, his last movie, Eyes Wide Shut, I don't know if you know this, but that's his last movie. Now you've seen Eyes Wide Shut. Tom Cruise? Yes. And Nicole Kidman. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was filmed in a Rothschild's mansion here in this country, by the way. So it is like true to Stanley's form, totally authentic. The the actors in Full Metal Jacket, Stanley Kubrick, who directed that, they they had to do a mini boot camp. You can't teach actors to like march and do the kind of stuff that we Marines do. No way. You ain't gonna show up on set and like just march. <laughs> uh-uh. It took us hundreds and hundreds of hours to get to the point where we're not like some gaggle fuck. Anyway, in Eyes Wide Shut, you, you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate this. The audience will appreciate this if they don't know. Stanley Kubrick had a deal like no, no other producer director had. Nobody. 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 Not George Lucas. Nobody. 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 He had full editorial control over his movies. Total. N now... It's the, it's the studios that have that control with every other producer director, literally all of them, all of them, the studios rule Hollywood, which are all owned by Jews. There's a book, uh, an empire of our own. It's, it, it talks about the Jewish roots of Hollywood. Anyway, Stanley Kubrick, because he was the best, absolute best, he had full editorial control. Now, he was always a smoker, but he had sort of, you know, stopped smoking, but he always smoked Marlboros, and he was chain smoking in the process of uh, completing the shooting for Full Metal, or excuse me, Eyes Wide Shut. Now, for those who haven't seen the movie, it's, it's a stunning movie. The cinematography of the movie, the shots of the ceremony of the robed masked people with these supermodels uh disrobing and whatnot i mean the whole thing is really authentic and if anybody would have known stanley would have known like how the uber rich act and and what they do stanley when he finished the movie which was 1999 he went to the studio to air the final cut his cut of the film and he went with his assistant. Now, he left his assistant. His assistant wasn't allowed to go into the studio with the big wigs, so it's just Stanley and the heads of the studio. The assistant sat outside. Stanley went in, and they watched the movie. And what the assistant said was that he heard nothing but yelling. Like, yelling. Stanley yelling. And... Clearly, uh, the studio heads were telling him something he was not happy with. And after all the shouting and whatnot, he came out. He didn't say a word to his assistant. His assistant didn't ask. They went home. Stanley ended up dead uh, within, I believe, a week or two after that. So the movie aired after he had died. The thing was... It's come to light that the final cut of the movie, which clearly the studio heads did not approve, the final cut, they, they, want, they took out 24 minutes of that film. There's 24 minutes of that film that Stanley Kubrick had supplied to them, but they cut it out. Now, if you go back and watch the movie, that is a satanic sexual ceremony. Look at the red robe look at the colors of the robes, look at the, 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 the mantelpiece, look at the use of the smoke. This is all satanic. I am absolutely sure that the 24 minutes that they killed Stanley over and didn't allow to be aired, which I would love to see, would have had, I, I believe it would have had the, the child sacrifice elements, something, and tying it into our leaders. Because this is the way they run the show. This is why all of our politicians are errand boys, bootlickers for the Jewish state of Israel. Otherwise, how do we explain it? How can we possibly explain it? And I have said this publicly many times over. Now, you need to, have you ever read The Art of War by Sun Tzu? Yeah. You can read that in a day. I highly recommend it. 
you need to understand your enemy. You know, the very basic concepts of if you're going to take on an enemy, if, you, if you're fighting against some opposing force, you must understand your enemy inside out and backwards. So you must get into their mind. You must understand their resources, everything. I've done this with the powers that be. You know, you have to get into the mind of a psychopath, of a sociopath, of a narcissist. You need to get, take that to a next level into the spiritual realm of a socio-psychopath. And so that's not something that most people uh, would even think to do or entertain. Um, but in order to understand and fight an enemy, you need to put yourself in that position. You need to think about things from their perspective. And I fully acknowledge that if I was in charge, right, if I'm the big head honcho, right, and somebody wants to join my club into the uber rich, like the banker uh, Bernard, I forget his last name, Dutch banker who talks about this. He was tapped to be invited. And uh, he was uh, tapped by a, a top level financier, so the uber rich, right? So he was working as a, a financier banker for uh, this company, which was, again, you know, Jewish. Um, and the big head honcho, like top level, uber rich Rothschilds type banker, approached him and said, listen, we like you. You're making a lot of money for us. Would you like to join the top echelon, the uber rich, the, the billionaire rich? And uh, he said, yes, yes. He said, listen, I want you to know this right now. If you want to join us, you need to put your conscience in the deep freezer. You still want to join? He's, he said, yes. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Now, he'd already been doing immoral things. Like, you know, <laughs> these guys, these financiers are like bankrupting nations and creating poverty and, you know, war, profiting off of war and all that kind of stuff. So he didn't have a problem with that. But the, the banker said again, listen, I'm talking deep freezer. He said, yeah, no, 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 I want to do it. The banker then explained to him, okay, here's what we're going to do. Now, this is the way the world works. And I'm, I, I'm saying that this would be my policy. If I was them, if I'm a top level leader and my goal is total domination, right? The money is not this. You asked me that. It's not about the money. They have the money. They've had the money. <laughs> they have all the money, man. It's not about the money. They have all the money. It's power. It's power control. Like the, the, the pedophile rapes the child. It's about power I mean, whatever sexual gratification they get out of it, it's mostly the domination, the hurting of a child and the domination. That's what they're getting off on. So the banker is then told uh, by the big banker, here's what's going to happen. We're going to have a little ceremony and you're going to be the guest of honor. And at this, uh, this ritual ceremony, we're going to have... Uh, we're going to have a, a baby and that's going to be the sacrificial baby. And uh, to culminate this ceremony, you are going to place that dagger into the child and you're going to be part of the club. When he was told this, and you can watch it, you can, you can watch what he says. He's not allowed to say who this banker was, by the way, they let him live. Why? I believe uh, there's a universal law that you have to serve notice. I, I know this in law, and I, I've, I've talked to philosophers and lawyers and everything. Everything they say, uh, every, everything that they do to us, they've, they've declared. They've said they would do it. Literally, everything. COVID, too. All of it. Everything. So I believe that's why. There's a universal law. Like, I believe God, divine retribution could come upon you if you don't warn your victim of what's coming. And it, honestly, they've <laughs> anybody who thinks like, oh, how did you, dude, they've declared all this stuff. All of it is declared. All of it is declared. Whether or not you watch it or whether or not you acknowledge it, that's on you. You know, God gave us a brain. You got to use it. You got to put some effort into it. Or you can just go ahead and watch the news. Anyway, when the Dutch banker realized that all he had to do was stick a dagger in a baby and he would be uber, uber rich, he 
backed out. He was like, I can't do that. And what the big banker said was, normally, this is an offer. I made him an offer he can't refuse. You know, <laughs> it's one of those, like, you know, you're not allowed. But for whatever reason, uh, they he said, okay, we're going to let you go on this one. You're never going to be invited again. But you can say what was offered, but you cannot say who I am. Those were the conditions, and this is what he's done. So whatever reason, he was the guy. Now, of course, we should all know this guy. And what benefit, let's put it, what benefit would there be for him to make this up? How would he benefit from this? He's already rich. You know, what, what, what book sales or some shit? And he doesn't make money from it. <laughs> he doesn't. He gets interviewed, but that's, and, he, and where's the motive? Like, why are they killing off the baby though? Why did he need to do that? Because that's, that's, that's paying homage to Satan. Satan requires sacrifice. This goes now, even in the current context, have you heard about the red heifers in Israel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's part of their ritual, their satanic ritual that they intend to build the third temple to sacrifice the perfect red heifer. That's to Satan. And that is supposed to bring back their Messiah. Who is their Messiah? The devil. Well, there you have it. That's who they worship. And they have a spiritual practice. Because even the, what is the, what's the thing called with the, the, the goat's head? What is the, the devil called? Ba Baphomet. Baphomet. So yeah. it's got tits as well. Yeah. So it's a tra is it transgender? Androgynous, is that, transgender. Is that yeah. true? Yeah. Yeah. It's why the, the goat's head? And why the horns? If you look at it, it's an inverted pentagram. The V? The, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The goats like the horns go out this way, and then down to the mm -hmm. yeah. It's and then the ears come down, so it's an inverted pentagram. Um, yeah, symbols and numbers are very important to them, and I'm I'm not the world's preeminent expert. Yeah, on but that's it. why it's everywhere in every movie, every song. The symbols are there, literally. Um, what do you think of the Simpsons making a lot of predictions? Yeah, that's uh, well, it's undeniable. That's what we would call predictive programming, isn't it? So, I mean, we all love the Simpsons, I think, you know, I mean, I've, I've loved the way they take the piss out of Americans. It's kind of like Family Guy and, and some of these uh, other, oh, Beavis and Butthead, I love that. I love those guys, <laughs> they did. <laughs> and they're producing some really wild stuff. Well, you, you know, predictive programming, right? Well, that's part of where they, they, like zombie movies, that's another one. We do see actual zombies. They they are existing, and there is. We we if you dig deep into the the rabbit hole, you'll see that there are ways to turn living humans into zombies, literally. Um, and if you if you add into it the spiritual dimension, see again because people have been disconnected from source, they don't understand the power of black magic and and uh, the spiritual uh, spells that are cast. I know a lot about this and I, I, I live like, if you are not, there's a great example of this, by the way, that really kind of ties into this aspect of it. I forget her name and I really need to refine the, the, the video documentary. I need to find this, but, um, there was a lady verifiably raised in a satanic cult, right? She 100% verifiably, undeniably, uh, a satanic family cult. Um, she went through all the horrors that, that, that you go through in this process. Like they do things like put the child into a coffin with a corpse and like, you know, keep them in there for however many hours or whatever, just like deep, deep, deep traumas that invoke, uh, a mind controlled state that takes you into the higher spiritual dimensions of serving Satan. Like, again, this stuff sounds crazy <laughs> to, you know, many people, but this is their religion, man. It's real. Anyway, she was a, became a satanic priestess, right? And, uh, again, people can deny it all they want, but it, it exists. It exists. And, and she was like, became really powerful and she would cast spells on people like the enemy, the targets, like the ones that maybe were adversarial or looking too close or whatever, she would cast spells on them and they work, they work. 
with exception. They didn't work. Like she could witness how much they worked, like people's lives would be destroyed, would fall apart, you know, like relationships would break up, whatever, children would die, whatever, things like this, when they spells were cast. But there was a certain group of people where the spells were useless. Now, this is according to her, okay? Again, this is not like, this is not some crackpot selling books. This woman clearly indisputably lived in a satanic cold family she said there was one group that were impervious christians who were praying and it used it pissed her off it made her angry it made her feel rage now when she did this interview that i'm talking about she had left the satanic church now, when she was in it, it pissed her off. It made her anger, angry, it filled her with rage. But for whatever reason, and, and I believe it was definitely directly inspired by what was initially anger and rage became an enticement, an invitation, a thought, a, a choice where she rejected the satanic church and came to God based on what she saw, which initially pissed her off. So now people can say that's hocus pocus. They can disbelieve it. That's fine. That's, that's your prerogative. God, God gave you free will. Um, but I look at evidence. I look at evidence. And the evidence to support not only this particular case, but other cases, uh, Anton LaVey, the father of Satanism in America, his last words were, oh my God, what have I done? Mm. There's a couple of people who've done that. Yeah. Yeah, he realized he saw the wrath of God. Um, this is why I don't hate these people. I don't. I pity them. I really do. And I've had people try and destroy my life, like literally. In literally. What way? Um, because of the you speak about some mad stuff, though. Yeah. Like it is understandable that you are a target. Yeah. What yeah. do they try and do to you? Slander and libel, mud slinging, um, uh, also. Uh, police stealing everything I own um, from me. I've lost everything I own three times in, in the last 10 years. I've been homeless on the street. I've lived in my vehicle. I've been in prison several times. I've been tortured. I've been poisoned, dead on the ground, killed, brought back from the dead. Um, I was in one of the worst uh, prisons in the world. You could Google it for a six day visa overstay after being brain damaged and Trump. So I can go on and on and on. You know, I, I've, I've been through, I've been through the fire, you know, I've, 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 I'm a hard man, you know, like at a certain point you, you just, you kind of reach that William Wallace point, right? You know, like you killed the woman I love, you know, you, 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 you've destroyed everything that I cherish. Fuck it, dude. I accept whatever comes, man, you know? I don't, you know, when you look at that kind of spirit, I think that's sort of the epitome. It's kind of like what we've totally lost with this progressive fucking pussified, you know, male. I, and I, you know, I bet you know this too, especially with that voice. It's a very manly voice, like Sean Connery fucking, that's a man for you. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to slap her. Remember when he did that? I've seen Bill? that interview. <laughs> he doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> He said, the interviewed, the interviewed him many years later after it, and he said, do you still agree with it? He says, yeah. But that is mad. You yeah. could not say that, any of that shit now. No way. No, no. I mean, you know, look, I've never, I've, you know what? I did hit a girl. I did. Here's a little story for you. I was in third grade. I was in third grade, right? So this is right around the age where, you know, girls and boys start wanting to maybe like kiss or whatever but she was ahead of me and i was a cute little blondie kid right so this girl i still remember her name i remember all the names of the girls that i was in love with most of which i didn't get you know but but whatever that was i because i was stupid i didn't know the game but anyway she was following me her name was chris bigano she was following me every day home from school and teasing me like like viciously like teasing me teasing me teasing me teasing me teasing me and i was like go away go away and she was doing it day after day and one day i just fucking lost it and i turned around and i punched her and i punched her in the eye and i gave her a black eye and she literally had to go to school for like days with a black eye and everybody knew i did it 
turns out she liked me, right? She fancied me. And her teasing was her way of getting my attention and whatnot. But I just took it completely wrong. That is the last time that I ever hit a woman. And I actually have gotten a black eye from an ex-girlfriend. <laughs> She's throwing dishes at me and all sorts of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I don't hit a, a woman. But I do really appreciate what Sean says. Like... A slap is a slap, all right? You're not going to, like, injure somebody. You're going to embarrass them. You're going to shock them. Um, and I, I, will, I can't see myself doing it, but I still appreciate the honesty of Sean. Yeah, that was it. Mad, you know? yeah. <laughs> What do you think of adrenochrome? It's real. It's real, and it's, it's, part, of, it's part of the uh, in extreme trauma of the satanic mind control MK Ultra process. Um, it's real. I know this much, like I told you earlier, when I went to combat uh, and earned my combat action ribbon, I was awake for three days. That's adrenaline. That's adrenaline, adrenochrome. So you put a child, a baby, and plus we see there's, there's empirical scientific evidence, these black eyes, that's from this process of putting the child under terror, right? Terrorizing them. And in that terrified adrenaline state, extracting that and i don't doubt that it, it it not from what i've read and heard have you ever heard of the frazzle drip no <laughs> that's like on the dark web for those that want to go like I've, I've seen some of it it's uh it's a video of hillary clinton and uma abedin remember her uma abedin she she was like a a, a democratic uh uh, like consultant that worked with her, her husband was Anthony Weiner. Remember, Anthony Weiner had the laptop that that the FBI had and had all this child porn and all sorts of like snuff films and everything on it. Um, he was a real pervert. Anyway, Uma Abedin was married to Anthony Weiner, who she was friends with Hillary Clinton, who I've all, I've said forever, like that that is not a human being. That is a that is a demon inhabiting a human vessel. That thing is not human. That that thing that thing's worse than Bill. Bill's just a perv who's been on the Lolita Express multiple times. Um, he likes to rape kids. Okay, yeah, but she's a special kind of demon. Like she's a satanic uh, queen princess. She is. Um, anyway, this film Frazzle Drip. Uh, it it shows um, the satanic insanity of what these people do this goes next level they have a child in this video that is um fixed into a torture chair uh like when they circumcise you a dental chair but you have straps and you, know, you can so the head is strapped the wrists the arms the torso everything you can't move right nothing so you completely uh, immobile and vulnerable. Uh, Uma Abedin, there's video of this, and Hillary Clinton skin a living child alive, and they peel like the face of this child off. And you know what they're doing when they do this? They're like cackling, like demonic, happy, like smiles and like joy, like they're loving it. This is just how twisted it is. And Satan loves this shit. Satan wants that. See, and he defiles that which God made. God made all of this incredible, incredible. And I also, by the way, we don't live on a ball. Water, like, go ahead, make that bend. Doesn't bend. It ain't going to bend. It's going to go. Right, that's the level. It's going to level, period. Yeah, it can't. Not only that, there's a ton of other things, but um, um, yeah, Admiral Byrd's expedition to Antarctica, 1947. I highly recommend you have a look at that. What do you think of Antarctica? Well, it's the one thing all the nations of the world seem to agree on. Hmm, that's interesting. I know there's a we we we're. This is like uh, my enemies will use this and all the outrageous things I say and piece it together and whatnot. Bottom line is this. The reason why we've been led to believe, if you look at history, you'll see that the maps have changed. This is a fact. This is an absolute fact. They did not believe we lived in a ball. In fact, 
Columbus thought we'd sail off the edge of the planet. Um, there's more truth to that than people realize, but th there's not like a waterfall off the edge of this dominion. We're, we, and the Bible says we live in a firmament. We, we live in a firmament. And the Truman Show is part of what I was saying. They serve notice. That's part of how they serve. That's Hollywood serving notice. You don't live in a ball. You you live in a... And yes, space is a lie, uh, the, the, but it, it's meant to make us feel small and insignificant, right? I, like everybody else, I believed in the stars and wow, there's zillions of stars and each one is a, is a sun that could, you know, could have planets around it, which makes us feel small, doesn't it? Makes us feel real small, you know? Um, we apparently went to the moon, but we never did. And now they want to go, wait, why, are, why don't we have condos on the moon if we went to the moon? Like, why are we talking about going to Mars and shit? Why don't we have condos on the moon? Why? Because it's not what you think. It is fucking basically lights. <laughs> like the Truman Show. Remember fucking light drops down? It's and then it comes on the radio that it was an airplane that dropped up because people then buy into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the moon then? Um, that is an interesting one. You know, it, 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 there's a lot of... Well, it's actually, it looks like a mirror. If you, if you look at the flat earth stuff, it looks like a reflection of the actual flat earth. I, I, there's some evidence to show that that's what it is. And there is something potentially behind it, possibly. But that's not in the context of like, oh, the dark side of the moon, where we, we never went to the moon, much less around the moon. Um, the... Uh, it's also well known that you, you, you <laughs> like the highest altitude drops and shit and like the people you've talked to, right? Where they send stuff up. People have done this, like backyard scientists have done this kind of stuff yeah. and been able to validate like, no, it, it hits, it, it, it stops at some point. Um, so what they, do you think the create, what do you think the creator is then who created us? Uh, yeah. God. God. Who's God to you? God, well, see, this, the creator, the creator. I believe, I believe, and here's the thing about God. Science became the new God, literally, literally. You can't prove God, can you? Mm -mm. Can't disprove God either, can you? I can't prove that I have an, a soul in here. Can't disprove that I have a soul in here. So this is where faith comes in. But when you use the techniques of social engineering and mind control, you destroy the faith by rubbishing the church, which is, was the connector to God in its pure sense. When you disconnect from source, you weaken, you weaken. Like as me, as an example, and I'm not that exceptional, the Palestinians to a large degree. The one thing they have, Allah. They, that's the one thing they have. I, I, I know, I know people who've lost loved ones, a family. I know uh, a mother, Zainat, whose child uh, was shot twice in the chest. His name was Ahmed. Um, he, he died over a day and a half in her arms. And the, the last words that, that Ahmed said to his mother was, don't worry, mom, I'm going home uh, to heaven to be with daddy, who had been executed in front of the family earlier. So now those that are atheists or agnostic or you know, the Ricky Gervais types or whatever, they'll laugh and think that's, you know, you're silly and this, that, and the other. That's fair enough. I think the thing that shows God's love for us in the greatest degree possible, it's similar to being a parent. Most parents, to one degree or another, have some expectations of their kids. They do. They, and many blatantly so whether they you know force them to go to piano lessons or some sports thing that they're not really keen to do or to the university or to take over the family business or whatever like a lot of parents do this that is not true love and what made my mother so special is that like i burned my u.s passport 20 years ago in baghdad while it was occupied by the u.s forces in baghdad occupied me the guy who fucking said fuck you burning my u.s passport my mother gave me i didn't have money i've not chosen this path for money 
any help anybody you know wants to give me and mon monetarily fantastic honestly like we do this together man the more resources i have the more i can do the money that i got uh to be able to go and burn my u.s passport which was one of the best that's another good thing what did i say 20 years ago i had a sign behind me it said everybody was saying support your troops you've been to america you know how they love you know oh thank you for your service they were all saying support the troops support the troops with the yellow ribbon I had a sign behind me when I burned my U.S. passport after reading a statement charging the U.S. with crimes against humanity and genocide. And the sign said, support your troops. Bring them home now. What if they had listened to me? Those 22 a day that were committing suicide when you were saying thank you for your fucking service. If you really wanted to thank them for their service, you'd bring them back home and let them defend the homeland. Because Iraq ain't the fucking homeland. And there ain't no weapons of mass destruction. And you've been lied to. So anyway... Um, God is, 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 uh, he gave us what I believe is, that's why I love him. Free will. I'm a free man. I choose which path I want to walk. What is free to you? Free will. Is free to my mindset or is that? We make decisions. It's up to us. We can be mollycoddled. We can be brainwashed. We can be intimidated. We can be coerced. But at the end of the day... Just like William Wallace in Braveheart. Free will, right? All he had to do was say, mercy. What did he do? Freedom! Fuck yeah. I, I'm a free man, and I will, I will make my own decisions, and I will be judged by my decisions. But a parent who expects their child to do what they envision for them, that's not love. That's not love. God... I, I know. I know I'm not the only one. There's a lot of very special people who have lived. Many whose names we don't know. They're not written in the history books, but I've met them. And many who we do know. Many who accepted death. Malcolm X, as an example. Jesus, as an example. Many others who chose death because they felt something stronger than a desire to preserve life. They made a choice. That choice was theirs. No one will convince me that anyone manipulated me, extorted me, intimidated me, coerced me into anything. Even now, the things that I've said here, I should be being quiet. I, I'm like under bail, like I'm a terrorist, like fuck you to the end. I will fight you all to the end. That's free will. And... If he didn't love us that much, he would have made like a Shakespeare play. Oh, I love that character. Watch what he, he's sitting there having to laugh. Like, I believe that that's also the implications of that are massive. Free will is the greatest blessing of all or the worst nightmare. I do see also, by the way, I don't know if you've looked at, you know, the Bible or prophecy or any of this kind of stuff, but... You can look at the historical archaeological evidence for Sodom and Gomorrah, which I brought up as this town, what it is. Like, it is really time to get out of Dodge. It really is. Like, this place is going to burn. Um, if you go back to Sodom and Gomorrah, um, the evidence, the archaeological evidence, which we really can't dispute, shows that there were 4,000 degree temperatures there in the place where they were doing all this sacrifices the you know the babylonian like really human sacrifice animal sacrifice bestiality you know all of this type of stuff which you also saw in berlin before adolf took power literally literally it was happening there these types of things um 4, degree heat like they there there's there's basically um like stones or uh, other other uh, like clays or whatever that um, that have been they the only way they could get into this form would be heat that would be like that hot four thousand degree now we don't have anything terrestrial that we can use to explain like what would cause four thousand degree heat but if we look at the Bible it says that God rained down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. So I'm not counting on God or Jesus to come back and save us all. I'm really not. Um, but I also know there's empirical evidence getting to nukes, as an example. I've read, uh, we're talking top-level security clearance ac uh, accounts 
from from people whose security clearances and and credentials cannot be questioned there have been multiple uh atomic uh launches nuclear launches and we have physical empirical evidence that that these uh weapons have fallen to the ground inert um is that god perhaps or is it just a failure of the technology? What about the fake UFO invasion they're planning, apparently? I've been saying that for years. Well, we, we know anti-gravity technology exists. This is where we're, now we're getting into Antarctica and back to that. So they all have this treaty saying not to go there um, because apparently we respect nature so much. bit strange because we're kind of raping the rest of the planet, right? But apparently we care that much. That doesn't make sense. If you, if you look at it logically... I'm sorry, that doesn't make sense. I don't believe in the virtuous. Okay, they want the resources, okay? Yep, yeah, the water, actually. <laughs> the water will fucking provide us, like, pure water, like, really pure water. So there's there's a lot of value there. But all of the nations have signed on to this Antarctic thing. If you try and sail down to Antarctica, you will be received by, you know, the top, like kind of military capacity vessels and you know you, you may never come back for you know i mean some people apparently disappear but they all appear to agree on this if you go back to admiral birds have you ever come across admiral Byrd's secret diary mm -mm. oh you'd be you'd be fascinated by that um admiral bird was uh like charles Lindbergh. he was an aviator a pilot um, you know, Charles Lindbergh, who flew across the Atlantic, right? The first transatlantic flight was Charles Lindbergh. Um, it was actually him and Admiral Byrd who were like sort of competing to be the first one to do it. And Admiral Byrd was almost first, but he ended up not being, and Lindbergh was. But Admiral Byrd was the most highly decorated military man at that time in history, Okay. He was of the highest uh, moral character. He had the fortitude, the strength, the skills, the leadership capacity, all of it. Um, he also uh, served during World War II. And after World War II, this is a known fact, Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists had expeditions to Antarctica. In fact, they spent a lot on expeditions to Antarctica, like a lot. Like there was clearly some sort of fascination with Antarctica. And so when we took over Germany, all of the records, which the Germans were methodical about record keeping, by the way, they have no records of, ex you know, six million Jews and all this, none, 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 zip, zip. So the, uh, they got all the records and the top secret stuff, which would have included the Antarctic expeditions that, that the National Socialists had sent down there, which they heavily invested in. Two years later, 1947, was the largest expedition in the history of the world, which Admiral Byrd was the commander of. So he was sent as the commander for the biggest expedition in history, they had an aircraft carrier, they had battleships, destroyers, supply ships, planes. The planes were kitted out in such a way that they had to have extra fuel and they were heavy planes. So the aircraft carriers had to go at full speed, like 30 knots into the wind, just to hope that they could get this thing off the ground with all the extra fuel to be able to fly over Antarctica and map it because of what they found in so-called Nazi Germany, National Socialist Germany. Here's what's happened. Here, here's what happened, according to the diary. Admiral Byrd, when he came back and gave this report to the Pentagon, that's who he answered to, the Pentagon, they told him, after he spilled the beans, to shut his fucking mouth and to never mention anything ever again about it to anybody. Now, when I tell you what the story is, the brief version of the story, you'll understand why this was a heavy burden on him. Okay? So he didn't say anything, but he did write into his diary, which was found by his, his either his son or grandson, about 
10 years after he died, right? So, or a few years after he died. What the diary says is this. They get down to Antarctica. The planes take off. They all have their trajectories. He is the lead pilot, and he has a co-pilot. They fly on these azimuths, these trajectories, and he's got a log, which the physical log, which he, he maintained. So like every 15 minutes, he would have radio contact. Everything is fine. And if there was anything unusual, then he would note it in the log, right? So everything is going fine. They're flying, they're flying, they're flying. Altitude check, you know, everything flying, flying. Then he, saw, he sees something and he notes it's starting to see some discoloration in the ice. Keep in mind, it should be perfectly white down there. Discoloration would denote some sort of organic matter or possible meltage or whatever. He keeps going. Next thing, he starts to see some green, which makes no fucking sense at all. Not based on what we're told. Not zip. He then, uh, and this is all like the while this is happening, he then sees what appears to be an elephant. But he bends around, does a banking turn to come in closer and lower his altitude, and he corrects, it's a mammoth. It's fucking like a mammoth. And he keeps going, and now he sees mountains and a forest. And that's where the plane starts to act wonky and the instruments start to not work correctly. And he notes it. And then he then sees aircraft alongside him, flying saucers aircraft. And the controls of the plane are basically like they go completely. The instruments are all gone and his radio contact is stopped. All of this is noted. I'm going a little bit out of sequence here, but this is what happens. The plane and the sound is gone, like the sound from the wind, and that's gone. Like the instruments don't work. The plane is no longer in his control. The sound and the wind is all gone, and yet they're moving at a fast pace. And there's these vessels. And over the radio then comes a message. Admiral Byrd, Admiral Byrd, do not worry. We have taken control of your plane. Uh, and they say, we will be landing you in seven minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what can I do? So... They go with the flow, and they, and the plane then literally, like, it's like in an elevator shaft. Like, it literally lowers the ground and just a little bump, you know, when it touches the ground. And then the aircraft, they land around, they've landed around him, and guess what? They have markings on them. They have markings. You know what the marking is? A swastika. A fucking swastika. This is in his, <laughs> this is in his, this is freaking swastika on there, right? By the way, I have a swastika on my, tattooed on my body here and here. That symbol is a beautiful peace, symbol. Saying a peace, is it not? Yes. Is that Buddhism? Yeah, yeah, but, yes, Hinduism, Buddhism, and all over Asia you'll find them. It's a beautiful symbol. That's why I picked it as well. Anyway, there's a swastika, swastika emblems on the, on the flying saucers, right? The uh, beans in in the uh, in the vessels step out, and he notes what they look like. They're blonde, blue-eyed, and they're very tall. They command him to exit the airplane and open up the hatch to make sure of what's in it. And then they tell him. We are going to take you to the city. He it's then put on a platform that like travels at this fast pace towards a city that he describes as like a crystal city with a light 
unlike any light he's ever seen. And also he mentions before that the sun, that he couldn't see the sun anymore and that the light had changed. But this also is in concert with the city now that's like a crystal city unlike anything he's ever seen. And it's um, uh, nothing like nothing like anything he's ever seen. They take him, they identify themselves as the Ariani. The Ariani, blonde hair, blue eyes. They then say that he, they, they tell him to, when they get to uh, the border of the city, that his, they leave his pilot, his co-pilot, at the plane, right? So he's having to sit there. And then Admiral Byrd is taken. And they say, you have been chosen because of your honorable character to meet the master. Okay, so <laughs> Admiral Byrd is now being taken by the Ariani, who have a swastika, their blonde hair, blue eyes, and they're a bit tall, and they're being taken to the master. They take him into the city, and they they provide him some drink of likes he's never had. He said it was amazing. Whatever they gave him, this drink was incredible. And the city was just like, the, the light emanated from the walls, and it was like, you could I don't where's the source I don't it just like comes from the freaking walls and they take him to uh like a, a lobby type office or whatever and they tell him the master will be with you in a moment and then sure enough he is summoned into a room and there's a big like board table uh in a beautiful like amazing room and the master says please have a seat. And here's what the master says to him. He says, and, and Admiral Byrd describes him as a, clearly a, a being of wisdom, a man of, of wisdom, like, you know, of age, but youthful at the same time. The master proceeds to tell him that, uh, that they are uh, the Ariani and that they're part of a civilization that is many thousands of years in advance of humanity. Uh, and that they live within the hollow earth um, as he's been taken because it goes down, the city goes down into the inter internal regions of this flat earth. And um, that he has been uh, brought here because although the policy of the Ariani, which by the way they have, he witnesses other beings, like not just the Ariani, like there's other ones that seem sort of more primitive or... Um, more whatever reptilian or you know like this like that stuff does exist here and he says that he was brought here because of his noble character and because that they had tried in their uh, flugel rods they're called these ufo things the flugel rods they had tried to go and contact our leaders uh, but every time they had tried they had been shot at aggressively by our aircraft and therefore they didn't weren't able to make contact so he was being summoned to be the conduit to send a message to his his bosses the pentagon and basically the message was this we have a hands-off policy we have our dominion you have yours you have the terrestrial realm we have this um we we leave you be um at least the Ariani, although that doesn't explain some of the, you know, the, the reptilians or the greys and all this other evidence we see. Um, he says, but the policy had to change in 1945 because, and I've been to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when they used nukes, mm, that was a problem. That was a problem. Now you can imagine if they lived millions of light years away, it wouldn't be a big deal, would it? But if they live on the same dominion as us, yeah, maybe those nukes might be a bit of a problem, right? You know, like for them. Um, so that was why he was being summoned to take back a message and to say that this is, is something that humanity should not be playing with and that there was a way... Um, to avoid the darker consequences of what could happen. Samson option Israel, by the way, been warning humanity forever. Um, and that that was the point. And it was, again, his moral character and his nobility that led to him being chosen 
and that his job was to now take this message back. And with that, very cordially, they ended the meeting, and he was rushed at a you know at a pace to kind of so he wasn't gone too long. You know, they did this fairly quickly because how are you going to explain like the extra several hours that you couldn't have possibly been in the air, right? He goes back. He says nothing to anybody. Uh, they bring him back in the plane. They're alongside him, and they say, we're going to release uh, control of the plane. You're going to take control back. And sure enough, they do that. He sinks a bit, and then the controls work, the plane, the wind, and everything, and he flies back. Um, he he basically just tells his co-pilot, everything's okay. He doesn't tell him anything more than that. And they go back, and eventually they sail back um, to Washington, D.C., and to the Pentagon, and that's where he reports, and that's where they tell him not to say a fucking word. So that might explain why all the nations of the world agree on Antarctica, which isn't uh, an island at all. It is an ice wall. Round the earth? Yes. It's an ice wall. So we don't live in a ball. We live in a flat dominion. Antarctica surrounds us, and there are channels. And if you look at the older maps, you have Lemuria and... Uh, is there places beyond yes. Antarctica? Yes. Because I had a flat earther on, he says it was all places beyond. This is what extra life is and like ET kind of extra terrestrial kind of. Yeah. And it might all sound far fetched. We would understand it might be crazy and we could be fucking crazy. I don't know because I've never seen it with my own eyes, but I'm open to it. I'm open to the ideas because I've seen some wicked stuff in this planet that has been debunked to be true. So there can also be beautiful things and people who have the answers. Maybe we are kind of the avatars, maybe we're the aliens, maybe we're in a simulator. Um, there's many possibilities. Uh, there there's is, many yeah. theories out there that what we could actually be in. Um, but it just doesn't feel real to me. Something's amiss. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I same thing with Adolf in the, in the Jewish... Uh, Why did they have the swastika? Because of the symbol is, it's a beautiful symbol. It is the, so why the unity, the unity it, of life, and it, it's a beautiful symbol. The, the and ironically, like this is what they got me for hate speech on. I actually had they stole. I had the mother's cross. I have another one, by the way. Yeah, I have in 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 Germany. I explained it a little bit earlier. Um, there was a national award, so it's the same level of award that you would award a soldier who's done something special right there were other national awards in germany that were uh, provided for various civic duties and responsibilities of, of of you know honorable character so one of them was the mother's cross now i now speeches are being made of adolf from german into english and if you actually listen to what he said similar to like if you listen even better but putin like if you listen to putin um, or I met Sheikh, uh, or not Sheikh, but uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, who was the former leader of Iran. I've, I've sat down and talked with him. He was an amazing guy. Really, really uh, lovely guy to talk to. Uh, taking Adolf's words in, and putting them into English is going to change the equation. And I know people who are doing this already. If you listen to what he said about who controlled, what, what did Adolf say about Palestine? He said exactly what we kind of start in England. England's the instigator of that. The Grand Mufti of Palestine respected and appreciated and, and adored Adolf Hitler. Fact. Um, Adolf did not want to send all the Jews off to take over the Holy Land at all. He was trying to get them off to Madagascar or something. Anyway, so that symbol was, was chosen because of the, the very positive and beautiful aspects of what it represents. Um, and... The Mother's Cross is what I was saying, yeah. This award was given to mothers, and it, it's it's literally a cross, in, and it's it's a, a purple uh, color, which was my mom's favorite color as well. It's a, a lavender purple color, and within the cross, it has a swastika in, in, the, in the middle of it, um, and there's three different levels of this award, national award that was given to mothers. The, the bronze level was you had five or six kids. Six. Yeah, yeah, five to six kids. The silver was 
seven to eight kids. And then the gold was nine, 10 kids. So you got a national award and there's speeches by Adolf where he, he literally talks about how if he sits down with a woman who is a lawyer and she's writing laws and, you know, she's a businesswoman and she's all this. And then next to a mother who has raised uh, however many kids, the mother has done more. They are the future of, of the Reich, of the nation. You know, do we really want all of our women doing the legal work and, you know, the building of roads and going to war and, like, politics? And it's, he did not prohibit that, by the way. But he made it clear that the highest honor for uh, a nation is its mothers, is its women. He loved them so. He loved his mother. And he loved the Jewish doctor who sa helped save his mother. So this award, which has been taken as evidence of my hate, right? <laughs> it's an award given to mothers. And as I said in this interview as well, like with this conversation, my mother is my saving grace. The love she gave me, the unconditional love she gave me like God gave us, unconditional, free will. She never tried to stop me from doing these crazy things I did. She let me spread my wings and fly and always knew. She always, always showed her love to me. Always, always. And it wasn't that she didn't love me. I, she died at 64, partly from the stress of having me as her only son. Can you imagine? I mean, seriously. I am a nightmare in terms of like, if you worry, holy shit. You know, can you imagine that I'm her only child? I love you, Mom. <laughs> so anyway, she died at a younger age because of the stress of that. What do you think of all the Epstein stuff? Yeah, it's 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 part of like, know your enemy, right? Like, it, you know, I, I wouldn't let anybody join my club unless I had the goods on them. Because they were loose cannon, right? You know, I mean, a lot of people you couldn't just intimidate with like, we're going to kill you. No, no, no. We're going to do worse than kill you. <laughs> We're going to destroy your entire family name. We're going to absolutely destroy you. Can you, I mean, obviously, if there's a videotape, uh, there is videotapes of Bill Clinton, Prince Andrew, Alan Dershowitz, and a whole bunch of others, I'm sure, DiCaprio, all of them, raping children. And these children, I mean, I don't know, I haven't seen the tapes myself, but these children are so traumatized that they'll, 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 I don't know, I, I think... A lot of it is they'll be playing like they enjoy it and like that's part of the act that they're supposed to put on. But come on, what child in their right mind is going to want to have sex, especially Alan Dershowitz? Ugh. Oh, God, can you imagine? Oh, he's a grotesque man on every level to be forced to have that slimy thing like sliding on you. And oh, my God. So... They have videotapes of this, and I, I know I own you. If, I, if I'm the guy in charge, right, know your enemy, put yourself in your enemy's position. What are the cha If I have a videotape of you raping a child, how confident do you think I am that you're ever that you're going to keep your mouth shut about how the world re really works? Pretty confident, right? And if I didn't force you to do that, and I just trusted you, what liability might you represent to me? Too much. I'm not letting you in the club. Is that what they do get you to do bad stuff? So they have something on you so you don't speak out or, they'll, or they also discredit you? Why yeah. do you think Jimmy Savile was involved in like, royal families and he had an in? Because obviously people must get vetted. He's one of the biggest known paedophiles of all time. Never charged, never convicted. Thanks, Keir Starmer. Next PM, yeah. Sir. He got rewarded. Look at that. See? See how that works? So the guy, Keir Starmer... Now, sir, Keir Starmer, that guy, tell me he did not get a reward for saying, oh, not enough evidence. 500 children. The amount of evidence that already existed, already existed, that Keir Starmer had, that clearly, clearly has not been allowed to, to see the light of day, is because that system protects the most grotesquely immoral satanic and if you're a moral man or woman and you genuinely seek the betterment of our planet and the welfare of people 
and the future for our children, you're a threat. They don't reward you for that. They do not. If you can, you do it in some benign way and like, we'll associate you with a charity and we'll give you some little thing or whatever, you know. But if you confront the system of power and you threaten to expose that in any meaningful way, you are considered, that is the most dangerous job. The, the weapon I wield is the sword of truth. How that was Savo? He was, I mean, look at the man, look at that grotesque thing with those, oh, God awful teeth and that just, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, they obscene. say don't judge a book by its cover, but you should fucking judge him. Literally, yeah. like he just looks Bad. every bit the pervert, like <laughs> the nightmare <laughs> uncle, like that comes around and the kids go running. Um, Cause he was a necrophiliac as well, wasn't he? Literally, yeah. He had these like morgues and hospitals and because I had a man on who was abused by Ted Heath, prime minister. Again, another sick individual. Why are they all in power? Why do they all control the world and have a big say on this planet? How do they get in charge? That's these qualities. Like they, they also like when if you look at like uh, an investigator, you have social profiling, right? Like when you I, identify a crime scene, you start to build a profile for who might have carried out such an act. The powers that be have that down to a science to the point where they can identify, plus they also condition their servants. So like the boarding schools, I think we all know at least a little bit about the boarding schools. It seems as if this is a place that the rich send their kids to sort of torture their kids and traumatize their kids at an early age. It sort of teaches them the system, it, it, at least at the higher levels. We, we see a lot of evidence of this sort of hazing. Um, we see like skull and bone society, obviously, where they, you know, again, like being locked in coffins with, with dead bodies or reverence for like Geronimo's skull. They, they send these kids off and they're traumatized. So this is again where I don't hate. Like I do feel empathy for these, these poor kids. Like if I was born into a Rothschild family, and raised the way they're they're raised, I, I can't say that I would be the person I am today at all. That would be rather foolish of me to say that. I would be a very different human being. I, I'd like to think that I wouldn't be as evil or that I would reject it or something, but I don't know that. Um, you know, I, I can't say that. I don't know. Um, and I hope never to know, you know, to, to, and, to, and to challenge that. But my point is they traumatize them from a young age and they condition them. Um, and they socially profile them. So they prepare them mentally and they also profile them. And uh, Saville, he, he had all the signs of the things that they're looking for um, if you do a psychological profile. Uh, he, he had all the, 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 the signs of being one of, their, one of their good ones. He also, in his defense, um, is, is, as much as we look back at it and like refrain and, and disdain, the guy did have some charisma. He, he was a funny-witted kind of guy, and, and he actually did do his job in a way that commanded a lot of, like, adoration from, mm -hmm. you know, the, the fan the fanboys, you know. Yeah, you know, like, because he had an in, like you say, it's the, the manipulation tactics of trying to be a good guy. But then, again, listen, people was going to have photos with Savo because he was high profile then. You'd have wanted an in with him if you didn't know his background or his story. Sure. Um, same as Epstein, people on his flight logs are not necessarily on the same page. Do you know what I'm saying? They might have been, you don't know what they're part of, but if you're going two, three, four times when they're talking about the young girls and uh, Epstein having previous of being the math teacher and being a fucking sex case uh, way back then, the Prince Andrew meeting in the park, it is kind of all weird, the Prince Andrew interview. I, I never really understood that. That was but, the biggest train wreck of an yeah, interview. Yeah, but whatever. why? It's just... How about Hollywood and stuff? How dark is it as well? How how satanic is it? Or are we conspiracy theorists? You know, I, I one of the things that has uh, pulled me over these last few years has been some really really great content. I mentioned it earlier, Michael Pilates, um, uh missing four one one series. So this guy was a homicide detective um, and a high level one, like really really high level. Um, and he ended up, out of all these whatever thousands of cases that he, he dealt with, he got to some cases that were like there was no physical explanation for what the crime scene revealed. 
Um, you know, some examples of that is uh, Nahani Valley uh, or the Headless Valley um, in uh, in Canada, a uh, place that's super hard to get to. Like you, you really can't get into it, and it's very wild. And it is supposed to have like it's incredibly beautiful, but like bodies that are found where the heads are gone. Um, and there's like no blood at all, like nothing, no sign of any blood at all or other such things where like there is no physical explanation of the crime scene and the way the layout of the body is or um, the evidence as it's laid out. Like the only thing that could possibly explain it is supernatural, like really. And we do like I'm sure all of us, if we have any kind of wherewithal ghosts as an example like you know for a long time ufos and ghosts like oh you're crazy you know i think ghosts a little less um ufos it wasn't long ago like oh that's <laughs> it's like conspiracy theorists work for so ever, so long so what has pulled me in is what we would qualify as supernatural like skinwalker ranch i was just watching a video about this last night skinwalker ranch is in new mexico it's near area 51 um and uh, what you have is these stories that go back into like Native American uh, lore. Like they have their own stories that explain in their culture what these places are and the evil spirits that exist there. Um, and um, it has pulled me in over these years to where I've studied it. Uh, so you've got Michael Pallades, uh, Missing 411, and you've got other content creators. One of them, I forget his name now, right now, but um, he talks about a Hollywood party. That he went to and the way he explains the story he's a great storyteller it's an amazing story um and and this is fairly well known now because we've seen with hollywood it's only in the last year that we've really seen that pff, avalanche of like and it, it started so ricky gervais sort of started said yeah. started that a little bit look at weinstein r kelly yeah as a lot there is a lot of darkness out there getting exposed as well it is no it is and that's part of why i'm optimistic realistically mm -hmm. optimistic but um, this guy, he had moved from uh, Illinois to L.A., and this was like 2015, 16. Now, this is where social media influencers actually started to come into the fray. Before that, you kind of only had sort of the, the big boys, like whatever, you know, like Piers Morgan might have a show or something. But, but what started to grow in 2015, 16, this was the heyday of like an independent guy could set up his own little studio and start going out on the street or whatever and, and broadcasting videos and making a name. And it start, some of them started to really do well. So him and his mate moved out to California on this mission. And they got there and they looked at the California struggling existence. But little by little, they were making traction and starting to actually, you know, make enough money to where they could at least pay rent and kind of, you know, get by. And he describes how uh, when they were in this state, like, you know, not rich by any standard, but but doing well and starting to do better and, and so on. They were approached by this guy dressed very smart, clearly uh, a well-educated and connected man who basically said, uh that uh he 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 saw what they were doing and was impressed and uh that uh he'd like to he, he would like to invite you to a party a hollywood party right and this the events that occurred before this party were very strange they got an invitation in the mail even though they had not given out their address right so the guy said he would they were invited but then they got an invitation in the mail the letter was this very extravagant thing with a chain and like, uh, a, you know, very articulately written. He actually saved it and then he, he reads the actual letter. It's not your normal thing. When he got it, he called up his mate. D did you get? Yeah. Like you got it. Yeah. And like, so now they're excited like this guy, but it's also strange that like, how do you get our address? You know, how do you, <laughs> and our names, everything is all sorted. So, they get invited to this party. I'll give you the short version. When they get to the party, uh, which is standard in Hollywood. Now, I have been through Hollywood, and I've, I've lived in L.A. for a bit. And I, I'd say, although I never have been invited to the Hollywood party, 
I'm at least directly connected enough to know a lot about Southern California and the way it works. It's part of why I left. It just does not reflect my values. <laughs> anyway, um, and Hollywood is an interesting place. Uh, so they get to the party, and he's starting to have some misgivings uh, because there's just a lot of things that are a bit suspicious in this. But his friend's all excited, and he, he nearly wants to back out. He's like, don't do this to us. I have, you know, you have to go. No, no, no. And so he ends up going. He's a little trepidatious. They get to the, to the house, and his fears are allayed. It's like some gorgeous like house in the Hollywood Hills, right? Like, I, if, you, if you ever go there, like, it's, it is like you, you can imagine the life of living like in this place, for sure. Um, and so as is standard with these things, uh, you have to turn over your phone. You're not allowed to bring your phone in. Some of these parties, although not this one, you, they actually prick your blood and you have to give a blood sample, which is part of a blood ritual because they can take your blood and do shit, spells and shit with that. So anyway, they hand over the phones and they get invited in. And they said, you cannot be there uh, later than 12. You won't be let in. So they get there a little bit early and everybody's wearing masks. So true to Stanley Kubrick form, uh, everybody's wearing masks. But he says very clearly, you can tell who these people are. Like He doesn't name them and he's very specific about it. But let's just say it's got to be like the DiCaprio's and, you know. The, Jay-Z. Yeah, like these these top level, right? And they're all having a good time, right? It's drinks and it's social and everybody's happy and it's like, fucking hey, this is great, right? But then 12 o'clock strikes and everybody is told to go into a room, into the next room. And the attitude changes uh, and it what ends up happening is they go from room to room to room to room and i do believe it was six rooms six or seven six is that number? yeah each room has a theme and a color and an attitude he doesn't even describe which is which is in the last room but because of his his concerns about this party while his mate is like just loving it they're just soaking it all up the uh, one who's telling the story it describes how he basically kind of stands back and like he isn't drinking like everybody's drinking and i'm sure that you know there's there's all sorts of the favors that you would expect in a hollywood party and you know beautiful women and but everybody's masked and so each room has a theme and each room becomes progressively more debauched or dark and the attitude goes from like this happy, jovial drink social party, progressively darker and more intense to the point where he gets to this second to last room and he really wants out. Um, and I forget exactly how it happens, but, oh yeah, the original guy, whatever, sort of nods and, and, and one of the f f fucking service dudes or whatever, basically, uh, because he's not participating. See, they're softening you up, right? You're taking the alcohol, you're taking the drugs, but they're seeing that he's not doing this, so he's not in the right state. Um, so effectively, they, they boot him out. But they don't boot him out kindly at all, right? They boot him out the back, and I don't. he doesn't even get his phone back, and he doesn't have, like, I think a jacket or whatever, so he's booted out the back. He doesn't even know, like, it's his big estate, and he ends up walking around the house and he, he's there's a window into the last room and he manages to be able to see into the room and he says the things that he saw in there which people have been like oh you didn't go oh, you didn't see it and they give him shit for it he says listen I, i'm uh, why do you want me to tell you what i saw basically what what he saw i'm sure what he saw was like bestiality possibly uh sacrifice or the, at least the highest levels of sexual orgy, uh, you know, homosexuality, um, just, and, but he, the way he describes it, it's, it's more than just an orgy. It's like beyond dark. He said like, it's, it's like inhuman, like it, it, it it's, it's disgusting. It's, it's beyond, 
probably like you know shitting in, in someone's mouth and you know just like really just like the most crazy insanity and so the thing is though that each of these rooms that these social influencers go into which he didn't go into that one the one that would have really compromised him they have video cameras so they compromise and what they're doing is they're measuring you so this one who still tells these videos he just went to skinwalker ranch and he's made a bit of a career out of this you can dismiss him if you want but there's other accounts like this there's whistleblowers like uh i know i've seen at least a couple of women who've gone to these parties where they they like were in the parties and described these types of things look at your stuff with pete did they all yeah. the stuff that's coming out with him now and all these orgies sex parties because a lot of them yeah. are gay bisexual yes. kind of dark satanic he probably started off innocent but then tupac died biggie died um he kind of became the number one at some point and yeah, very dark individual him yeah. a lot of seedy stuff with his ex-partners being beaten tied up trafficked yeah. but if they're in the club why is it all coming out about them then because if they own the media the newspapers everything if they done something to upset the hierarchy for them to be then in the spotlight they must have uh, you know it is a really interesting question but i think the crux of it is that where i, I kind of go back love conquers fear right um, people, a lot of people th are so seduced by the intoxicant, intoxicating effects of money and fame and all of the things that Hollywood offers that they, it's like the boiling frog, you know, it, you, you don't generally go from like a moral person to jump head in, head first into like you know, whatever, homosexuality and orgies and like sharing partners and whatever. Um, you, they work you into it. In this case, it's accelerated. So they, 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 they identify these young influencers who've got potential and they see that potential. And rather than have that potential and independently, organically evolve and have the money that they would have maybe got organically and be independent, which could be threatening, they co-opt them and bring them in. That way they can control them. Um, but it doesn't work on some people like this uh, young man, who I definitely believe. Um, but again, it's not just him. There's other stories, other accounts that are consistent with what he says. And he says, actually, he made that video about this party over a year ago. Because the dam really started to break uh, 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 about really about nine, ten months ago that's when Diddy and all of this shit, and also uh, Cat, Cat Stevens, not Cat Stevens. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cat, Cat Williams. Williams. Cat Williams, he's been speaking a lot. Cat Williams was friends with Prince, who was, I remember when Prince came out and said chemtrails, and he's he was vegan largely as well. Um, he, well, Smith done a video back in the day, 30 years ago, talking about the sewers. They were spraying up chemicals that were poisoning people 30 years ago. He's obviously been now... Yeah. Tarnished and I've, I've rejected six figure sums for alcohol and gambling brands. I was a drinker, coke head, fucking yeah. gambling. But the thing is, you think about it. Imagine me telling people to don't gamble and don't drink because it's, it darkens your spirituality yeah. and pokes holes in your aura to be then saying, hey, gamble on this, fucking buy this bottle of vodka. <laughs> it does, you do think about it. Yeah. And because yeah. now I have become independent, we're nearly 1 billion views and downloads, which is unbelievable in six years. I'm just open-minded to everyone. I would have a Jewish, Jewish man on giving his opinion. I would yeah, have yeah. the Palestinian on. Just, I, I'm happy to give a free platform to everybody, but I need people to question everyone because not everybody's right, but not everybody's wrong. And my job is to try and stay on the path, but it does. Why do you think people gravitate towards fortune and fame so much? Part of me chased that years and years ago, going through my changes, because I thought it would fit the pieces. I thought... That's where my happiness would be. Thankfully, mine's has became gradually. It's not been an overnight success. It's been seven years in the making, kind of just chipping away, interviewing people, enjoying that. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, I've interviewed enough people to realise, well, I was chasing the wrong fucking thing because other people told me about their misery. Yeah. I don't want to be that way. So, But why do you think we gravitate towards fortune and fame? Yeah, you know, especially, see, I grew up in Southern California. How much money do you make? Who do you know? What kind of car do you drive? Status. That is your measure. Yeah, sexy. Literally. Yeah. And at a young age, I remember this as well. Like, I, I don't believe in false humility, and I don't also don't believe in braggadociousness. I have certain things, certain uh, traits 
um, and many of them are really in, very favorable. Now, I'm I'm a good looking guy, you know. I, I mean, same I, as myself, you know. Yeah, it's you tough are. life, mate. <laughs> like honestly, and I I, I, I don't uh, look. The, the, I know jealousy. Like, uh, if you're a good-looking person, you take care of yourself, and you have a bit of charisma, you're going to find a lot of jealousy. This is one of the lessons that we learn, and and that's part of why I've stood up for the bullied my whole life because, you know, I, I have empathy. My mother gave me that too. Like, I've stood up for those being bullied, literally. Like, I'm the guy who's fuck, dude. You want to pick on someone? Pick on me. Why are you picking on him? You know, I don't like that shit. And and at a young age, I think we get enamored with Christmas, like Sheikh Hossein, who I just spoke with, he calls them Santa Claus Christians. What the fuck does Santa Claus have to do with, with, with the birth of Jesus? And December 25th, that's a pagan date. That has nothing to do with Jesus. Anyway, so they, they materialize us from a young age. And I remember as a kid in high school, being good looking and having I'm being intelligent, not as wise as I sh could have been, should have been. Uh, but I, I had like I remember asking Michelle Trickley out, like the hottest girl in, in elementary school, blonde. She looked like a little Bo Derek. I got up the gumption to go ask her out, and and she turned me down, but she did it with a smile on her face. Said she was already going out with somebody who ended up being my fucking friend. I'm like you bastard, man. <laughs> anyway, um, I remember girls going out with guys. At a fairly young age, because I was middle class and even slightly upper middle class a little bit, but I was not in the upper, upper, like, class that I mixed with. It was in, in Scripps Ranch, San Diego, right next to Miramar, which is Top Gun uh, area. Um, I had friends that were living in places that were like freaking palaces, man, and gated communities with, like, amenities that, like, I could only uh, dream of, like. And I remember seeing how the rich kids who were like oftentimes like good looking or whatever, but, but stupid. Like I had more intelligence and I was more uh, entertaining, but they somehow were getting the girls that, that I thought maybe I should have gotten. And I think that was the beginning of my understanding that like money goes to money. Rarely does money marry outside of its class. It happens, but in general, man, if you got a whole bunch of money, you ain't even gonna give the guy the the, the guy the guy who's like doing plastering the time of day. You might have a drink or like have a nice little lab, but you ain't gonna marry the fucker. Money goes to money, and I started noticing this, and I think again it was just the gift of what my mom gave me in love. But people want, the, and they were conditioned through Christmas and materialism to want, to constantly want. I even hear my own uh, youngsters, uh, uh, you know, talking about I want. And it's it's like a never-ending sort of addiction of wanting, wanting. And it, it's never going to be enough. Why do people want that? Because they don't have leaders or, or examples of nobility and what real happiness is. They're sold an illusion that money and material will buy you happiness. It's a lie. In fact, it's even more than a lie. It's, it's the opposite of the truth. If you sell your soul, or if, I remember when I was 18, I was studying, I wanted to be rich, like everybody else at my age. I wanted to be a millionaire. <laughs> a million was a lot of money back then, right? And I remember vividly that... Uh, I, I, I looked at all the different ways to make money, and it was pretty obvious to me, real estate. You know, that's, that's the most obvious way to make money, real estate. So I, I took this course by a guy named Charles Gibbons, um, a real estate guru, and um, his course uh, taught how to make money. And as I was reading the course and studying the materials, basically what he was, was, what he was teaching was that if you really want to make the, the big money, it's always going to be distress sales. Those are where you're going to make the most money. So somebody in foreclosure, late on their payment, that's where you make the greatest money. But what I realized in looking at that was that, okay, so effectively, like, I'm, I'm like a predator. <laughs> I'm preying on someone else's weakness. And then, obviously, when I make the deal, like, I might be putting a family out on the fucking street, but I'm here celebrating, drinking caviar, you know, drinking champagne and, and eating caviar. 
And I, it didn't sit well with me. So I remember like, okay, and I kept wanting to see like, can I make money like in some way, like kind of standard, like I found a really good property and I bought it and I did, you know what I mean? But it was all basically about how to prey on other people. And I got to this exercise in the course and I remember it vividly, vividly to write down in list of priority what 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 you what you're seeking what's what's number one to you i knew immediately i knew immediately because of all this stuff i was reading about predator peace of mind peace of mind so getting back to this point the seductions of satan and materialism are very enticing like even i wouldn't mind like driving a lamborghini you know on the autobahn and I wouldn't mind. Uh, like I'm a member at, at, at the best gym in, in London right now anyway, so I'm, I'm actually enjoying that and taking care of my body. I'll be going there later today. But um, the good life, um, it has its enticements. I mean, I think you get it. We get it, right? I mean, come on. I mean, to stay at the Ritz-Carlton in Maui, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've been in these places. I, I've, I've been the guy who picked up my customers from such places. I, I know how first class service is. I've lived in places, by the way, Waimea Bay with a, a floor to ceiling window uh, uh, view of Waimea Bay and one of the most famous surf spots on the North Shore of Oahu. I, I've lived in other places that are incredible, like mind blowing. Um, I, I, I appreciate it, it's fun, but there th there's just this part of, of me that I don't want it, you know. I, 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 even when I have a ton of money, I, I intend to put all my money into like things like this, like good equipment, to, into tools, so that I can do my job better. Not so I can have more fucking toys, and play. But getting back to your question, uh, I might kind of throw it back at you, but I, I think you know the enticements of the materialism and the comforts that and the and the pleasures that we believe it will provide us, is what pulls us into it. And then little by little, if we're not careful, we end up sacrificing a little bit of our, of, of our ethics and our morality to get more of the money. And that's where that banker story kind of comes in, like put your conscience you in the get lost deep in freezer. You can get lost in that. But for yeah. me, it's okay to make money. And yeah. It's fucking okay to enjoy it. By all means, life is for living. Yeah. We are the directors of our own movie on this planet. We don't, like you speak a good game, I speak a good game, but... We genuinely might be crazy. We could be fucking diluted psychopaths. So it's good for people to question it. If you're making money and not doing any harm, by all means, good for it. Because money's an energy exchange. There's no meaning to it. There's no value actually to money. It's not good or bad in itself. Yeah, of course. It's, it's how like, it's used. Of course it is. So enjoy it. And it's for people watching or listening. Enjoy life. Obviously, because fear is what controls the world. But what we speak about also drills people with fear. Imagine you in your own little bubble. You're talking about fucking UFOs and 9-11 was an inside job and everything been satanic and to get to certain levels they're killing babies that fucking scares the shit out of people so it's good for people to question everything you're saying um fact check it what i'm saying i'm not educated on everything enough i try and find a balance of living life and trying to switch off as well but it's important and fair play for today i think that's us over four hours you've became my longest ever interview oh wow well, yeah and uh <laughs> it's 506 seven years mate so um <laughs> fair fucking play but it's flew in fast it's been very educational but it's good for people to understand question it all yeah. what's your whole rundown in life what how people can have a better life and try to find some balance and do good what's your a whole opinion of it all that is the purpose you know it really is the purpose honestly i i really i i i i as i said earlier i mean i've never expected to see the better world i i know that the stakes are very high and i know the dangers are 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 dire um but you know i need no more reminder than my family in gaza um to to inspire me to fight uh, to the to the end um but we are on the cusp right now, if there's a fitting way to, to end this, perhaps, at least from my side. This generation right now, I mean, I'm Generation X. It's it's in there. I've got the X in there. But we're, we're Generation X. I believe you are, too. 84. Yeah. So Generation X, I find that to be quite poetic because the X is the unknown. That's why Malcolm X, X is the unknown. What's your name? Malcolm Little. His name wasn't Little. They don't, they don't people from Africa ain't named Little. Um we could define that x and it's our generation we're the we're in the formidable age right here the young ones are teaching us a lot though 
they really are like i'm deeply inspired by the young ones basically wanting to divest from from israel and all in israeli investments with their universe this is very powerful this is a sign that that the tide is turning the dominoes are falling the dam is indeed breaking we have a grand opportunity here i would argue that this is perhaps the last chance we're going to get i do not believe that we can you know kick the can down the road and hand this over to the next generation. We are in a most special time right now. This is an incredible time. And how we define ourselves and what our legacy is, is truly up to us. But I'll be damned before I'll sit by and just watch this horror show play out without doing my part. And I see more and more and more people also taking that path. And I would argue that that is where the greatest happiness lies. This is, I'm happy, despite the fact that I look into all this darkness, despite the fact that I have loved ones that I know could be dead any moment, despite all the horrors that I have peered into and looked at, I'm happy. And why am I happy? Because I don't decide the fate of the world. All I can do is what I choose to do as a man, and I'm doing my best. And in that, I find the peace of accepting that which I do not control. But I know this much. While I cannot change the world, we can. We yeah. can. I think we'll finish up on that, brother. But just before we finish up, I watched a video on Benjamin Franklin. Do you uh, know about his history? Yeah, yeah. The guy who's on the $100 bill. The bones. Yeah, the like... kid's bones under his house in London. <laughs> 15 kids. And he's on the $100 bill, and he's basically hailed as a hero coming from nothing to be this successful businessman. Another and Freemason then, and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like, it is crazy. But again... Listen, there's Freemasonry as well. There's people in that who aren't the extreme end of it. Same as people in Israel, Palestine, UK, Ukraine. There's good people everywhere. That's every where it starts, life. though. No, from a business perspective, yeah. I'd be the first one to acknowledge. Oh, no, that's good for business, dude. You're, you're networking your contacts. But it's I know a 32nd degree who got tapped for 33rd degree, I'm the son of this person. And I know enough. I've studied it. You find out at the 33rd degree who you really serve. And guess who? It's Satan. It literally, by the way, Adolf Hitler outlawed Freemasonry. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> Ken, would you like to finish up on anything else? Oh uh, man, I just tell you, man, God bless you, and uh, God, really, I love the accent. I love the way you do this. This is like Joe Rogan esque. I'm going to be doing a, a similar thing. It's not really an interview as much as it's it's conversation. I appreciate you giving me uh, the opportunity to to talk as I do. As you see, I could have gone on for days, but I think this was a really good, appropriate time. I hope this show. Um, I'd love to have a copy of the whole thing for sure. And, uh, only after you air it, but, um, yeah, we can, we can change this world. We can make it better. And, yeah. uh, honestly, we've got a grand opportunity here. I think I'd love for people to really be inspired in some way and know that. How can people get in contact with you? Because obviously when this interview goes out, people are going to want questions, they want answers. Um, people are intrigued by this, my following, especially, uh, if you're a lot of criminals, all different people of all aspects of life. But these are the conversations I enjoy most. Like I say, I'm not the most educated in them all, but I dip my toe into a lot of things to kind of understand that, to then give me the understanding of life, how, how to have a better life and how to do better. But how can people get in contact with yourself? You know, my I've been like poor, literally. I've been in the street, everything, lost everything. And, and only uh, fairly recently uh, through some good moves uh, have I been able to to get the kind of uh, funds that have allowed me to expand my resources uh, a bit to the point where I can go to this gym and all. But kenokeefe.com is one of the things, like that website is being built right now. That's gonna be the hub because the way I speak, um, you know, I, I cannot anticipate for forever that I'll be able to use the platforms where even now my audience is restricted. They shadow ban me, they do a lot of stuff to keep me out of, of the eye. But kenokeefe.com, is going to be the place where uh, people could uh, contact me and, and there'll be a lot of things that uh, I'm, I'm going to be doing there, uh, voiceovers and consultations and also like a meet and greet. So I'm going to do that here in London, like I'll announce like, hey, if you want to come meet me um, and also like go to the gym with me is another thing that, that people could do, like come uh, hang out at the gym, yeah. do a workout. So this like is that. important for any mindset and it's a... Uh, it sets you up for good vibration and a good understanding that life ain't as bad as what it seems as well. Even though there's a lot of dark stuff, there's a lot of beautiful stuff as well. There's a lot of great people out there. There's a lot of good people. A lot of people are naive, but that's just the conditioning and programming they've went through for 20, 30, 40 years. So it is difficult to then 
rewire all that but it can be done but Ken like I say fascinating interview I wish you nothing but the best for the future no doubt we'll have you back on I'd love to have a debate with somebody sitting from the other side and having a discussion that'd be fun Let's um, do that. but all the best for the future Ken really God bless you brother and uh, take care